There we go. Gather around, freaks. It's time again. It's that time during the week where you gather around the internet uh, fireplace and turn on your internet radio, to tune the dial to, hey, did you see this one? And find out that it's, in fact, Jason's birthday month, and we're going to wrestle with more r- morality and mortality. It's, hey... <laughs> <laughs> I did to see this one. Gather round, freaks, because it's that time of year again. The time of year that one of your hosts subjects you to something guaranteed to bend your mind, body, and soul. It is with great pleasure that we extend to you an invitation to delve into the realms of extreme sports and theatrical magnificence. Prepare yourselves for an experience like no other, as hey, did you see this one? And Jason R. Phillips proudly presents Wrestling with Mortality! Let me tell you something, brother. It's that time of the month. Wait, no, wait. <laughs> Is this what you're meant to do at the beginning? Or? <laughs> well, let me tell you something, brother. It's that time of the week again, brother, dude. And this week, we're talking about professional wrestling. It's my birthday, dude. And it's professional wrestling month. And it's wrestling with morality and mortality, brother. I know I keep saying morality and mortality, but I keep getting those words mixed up. Are you wrestling with morality right now? I'm a little bit wrestling with morality. This is, of course, brother. I hated to see this one, Jack. And we're talking about wrestling movies this month. And uh, this is episode 100. Let me see if I can quickly find out what episode this is, because it's fucking, it's getting out of control, okay? Mm. This is officially episode 100 and 30 of hey did you see this one and it is season two episode 30 we've done it we've gotten to 130 episodes of whatever in the fuck this is it is oh thank you thank you i suppose it is a uh it is a movie reaction review roundtable show Mm -hmm. i think i've i've included all of the things that we have oh i forgot that it's on loop whoopsies sorry (laughs) you should just leave the loop through the whole thing so it's like we have a it's like we have a crowd oh uh, we're already we're already getting goofy and we're already getting silly. I've lost my podcast layout, so you know it's going good. Um, I would like to introduce myself, Jason R. Phillips. My uh, co-host, as always, is Stephen R. Robertson Water. Stephen what? Robertson Waters. That's me. I Steven. will figure. I'm just going to M Waters. Oh yeah, I know that. Michael, did I get it? Finally. Mm-hmm. Oh okay. Well, that was no. It's uh, Miguel. <laughs> Stephen Mussolini Waters. <laughs> miscellaneous Waters. Mussolini Miscellaneous. Um, and of course, uh, returning to the show for, I believe, the sixth time is uh, Tim Covey. Tim Covey, welcome back to the show. Welcome back to the show. Mm-hmm. Thank uh, you very much. Your DNA okay. is splattered all over the face. It's like a murder I scene. This one. Jeez. Um, <laughs> I have wrestling shirts for each episode of this month. It is my birthday month, and we we're talking wrestling movies. Uh, they uh, decrease in, in um, quality. This one, probably the best. And the last one is a really bad um, documentary I found on YouTube. Mockumentary, but I just want to watch it and see what it is. Uh, that's a little spoiler for you people playing at home. 
Um, and speaking of playing at home, we have a little game we play each and every week called Correct Movie Guesses. Congratulations. You have successfully guessed the correct answer, which is the answer you provided. Congratulations. The rules are simple. I On Monday and Tuesday, I usually post a portion of the poster for the movie we're doing this week, that week, and uh, I slowly zoom out between the two days and have people guess. Um, this was one of those weeks where, like, there's not much on the poster and pretty much everything gives it away. Uh, I did my best. I'll tell you I got more on the first day than I did the second because everybody who knew what it was just knew it right away. But I actually have a lot to get through, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, holdover from last week, uh, Ben Mason did get last week's episode, and I wanted to just give him a shout out because they've been doing very well lately on the BS Bargain Bin uh, podcast. Need more B movie schlock in your life? Join Ben and Sandra on the BS Bargain Bin podcast every Monday. Next week's episode, I believe now last week's episode, uh, the boys cover 80s classic with a question mark. Is it a classic? Uh, Earth Girls are easy, and I believe they're looking for, um, more selections for throughout the year for fan picks so go over and check them out you can find them pretty much everywhere just like us <clears throat> a friend of mine chris davies uh he got it right he said buy more physical media and support your uh local uh cinema it's pretty good uh nicholas latimer he just wanted to say world peace Movies by Doug. Uh, he's gotten the, the question right before. I've, we've talked about his podcast a little bit on the show. He wanted to say, check out my latest review covering There Will Be Blood on all major audio platforms and YouTube. Uh, Noel got Wait, it. He reviews good movies on his podcast? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> he reviews movies that people actually have seen. I guess this is, uh, we have that one month where we did those four modern movies from like 2022. And then this one. And then everything else is ancient or bad or stupid or in between. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, Noel, friend of the show, former guest of the show, uh, got it right. And they wanted the satisfaction of just getting it right. But I said, no, no, I'm going to give your podcast a shout out. Um, the Stick Taps and Stitches podcast, which is a hockey podcast. Uh, I think they do a couple shows a week or something. It may be just one show a week. Um, they cover all sorts of stuff on that. So, hey, Drupal, how's it going? <laughs> hey, um, <laughs> he's my friend from Texas. That's amazing. I'm just letting his. Uh, oh, thank you, Drupal. I appreciate you, and I appreciate that. Um, let's see. B Dolly was on the show a few weeks ago for Seed of Chucky. She wanted to say. Uh, I asked her what she wanted to say, and she said, again, just the satisfaction of being correct. Um, Ouch, there was a ghost podcast. Shout out to them. Um, ghost podcast. Not really much more to say, but uh, they wanted a shout out. Uh, also, Brenton Brown, friend of mine from like high school era, also just said no message, just like to be right. <laughs> There's a Maybe you don't read those ones. <laughs> yeah, but I like it because it's funny because people are just like, I just wanted to be right on your internet. Uh, podcast show how modest of them yeah um the rapper black rook also uh his name is kyle irl he got it correct uh gordon mcdonald <laughs> who always uh gets it right and then just comments nonsense that i have to edit this time i didn't have to edit anything he just said claw iron the mm. so useful Someone decode that message for us. Yeah, can we figure it out? <laughs> and then Chris Murphy of the uh, uh, Hold Up podcast and part of the uh, United Federation podcast, which we are proudly a part of, uh, got it correct. And he said, I'll get you next time, Gadget, next time, which also mm -hmm. kind of a reference. I mean, to be fair, your second clue was just Zac Efron with no shirt on holding a wrestling belt. So I don't know if that really, like, <laughs> you made it too difficult this week. It's funny, They're I doing did, high school musical? Yeah. <laughs> I did also see... Why does he look like he's a statue carved out of caramel? <laughs> <laughs> I did also see on your... Uh, like, I just saw earlier today that you commented on one of the TikToks, and you were like, you call that a, you call that a, a hint? <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? You might be dumb, buddy. Um, yes, but that is, of course, uh, the correct movie guest game. Thank you for everybody who participated this week. I appreciate you. Um, 
I do want to just on that note, the call to action portion. I got to do business. Please subscribe to us on all social media. Find us on YouTube, uh, Twitch. We are on X, Twitter. We are on everything, but I really only use uh, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook right now because that's where I have the most like built-in following. So our message gets out a lot faster there. It's hard to like get momentum on like on sites like Threads or Twitter because you have to like really just be on those platforms around the clock. Mm -hmm. uh, and also shout out, we we only used him for a moment this week, but White Bad Audio, who we use for people every week, uh, thanks to him. Please go and find him on YouTube. And, you know, do the thing, brother! Uh, Jack! <laughs> the Ultimate Warrior! <laughs> you know, ultimate Warriors laugh, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that's everything for house cleaning. I got it all done in 15 minutes this week. It's not mm -hmm. half past. Uh, I think if that's everything, we can go on to our brief history. A brief history. This is, uh, of course, the segment of the show where we just sort of talk about our history with the show. The three of us are pretty much going to have all the same th same one but <laughs> oh yeah i forgot we went to go see this together and, and that's been a brief history yeah. um no but it is a you know time honored tradition to give our guests the first opportunity to give the brief history so tim mm. why don't you just give all of our brief histories in one final <laughs> time? Well, thousands of years ago uh, i was back when the movie came out in the new year in january i believe and uh, uh it was kind of a planned field trip for any of us from uh two hosts of you and, and any of the guest hosts that could come along. And it turned out only I could uh, show up because uh, there's only my cat to preoccupy me in my personal life. So I came down and um, we saw the movie together and it was uh, the first movie I had seen in the theater since, um, was it Thor that I saw it with you two? Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Thunder. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Thor: Love and Condoms, and uh, another movie with uh, a big jacked man. Carmel. <laughs> Carmel, yeah, <laughs> candied people. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, but Love it was and condoms. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear God, I hope not. But I um, a follower, I can't even say we have a thousand followers on Twitch anymore. We have nine hundred ninety-nine. What the no, fuck? no? Yeah, we got to get more. It's a horrible game looking at the, the the clicker, Jason. Just don't pay attention to it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, it was, but the one thing that was actually great was to go see an A twenty four movie in the theater again. Uh, that for me had not been since before pandemic. So uh, particularly for me, that was actually a lot of fun, and um, and it was good to go to a theater not filled with a, a rowdy rowdy Piper crowd. But uh, <laughs> so a quick little pun. But uh, hey, hey oh, wasn't was it was it was it Love and Thunder when we had like a bunch of kids behind us just screaming the whole time and we were like, oh my no, god. No, that's when we went to see Across the Spider Verse and there was a oh, right. two young girls who were just taught like saying the thing would happen on the screen and mm. then they would just say it to each other back and you were on you were on my like left and Madison, my wife was on my right. So they were talking basically into Madison's head and Madison Ugh. hates like noise when yeah. she's trying to pay attention to things, yeah. but it was affecting all of us. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. yeah. I think the only reason I didn't tell them to shut the fuck up is because they were having fun they were having and I didn't want to like, it's not like they were being obnoxious. They were just enjoying the movie. Yeah. But seriously, shut the fuck up. We're trying to enjoy the movie. Too. It's a lesson to everybody. We're going back to the movies now. Please just, it's not a party unless it's a Fast and Furious movie. Those can be a party. Yeah. Yeah. I'll call you those. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but outside of that, I, I've watched the movie twice uh, to, in a, it's my little habit when it comes to, um, my uh, appearances on your show. And thank you very much for having me on again. I think this is actually like seventh or eighth. Uh, so it's getting, yeah. getting pretty up there, which is wow. Thank you very much. But, uh, so I watched it twice more and, um, uh, and it was interesting to revisit it. And that's my entire brief history. You're right. It is. This is your seventh time. And because you acknowledged it, you will not be asked to come back. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. I've, no, I'm just, I'm fully kidding. You are, uh, you are up there as one of our best guests, hands down. And it's funny, if you've been watching this show for a while since Tim started, you can actually see the evolution of his 
of his setup. Um, <laughs> he started from like a grainy, like <laughs> with a soup can and, and a string. Exactly. Hello, <laughs> oh, hello. Oh, oh. <laughs> Ahoy, hoy. Yeah, Just hello. shouting internet into the window. Yeah. <laughs> now you look great. Um, we need to get you a, a ring light. I think is the next thing. Yeah. Um, if you have something new every time you come on, it'll be great. In like in like ten years, where you're you're more professional than us at that point. I would say. <laughs> I'll do my little bits here and there. I, I, I care about the show, so I like to contribute any way I can. I appreciate it. You're like the fifth Beatle. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fake Paul McCartney or whatever? <laughs> no, there was some other Beatle that, like, I think it was. I'm actually... joking. I know what it means. Okay. I'll just explain <laughs> jokes to you from now on and pretend I don't get them. I was uh, also making a joke. That's <laughs> said, a good one. Um, Luna Dev and Eric uh, just wanted to just say this. Also, Luna hates all his dad. Yeah, comedy like, as well. <laughs> He's been replaced by a lookalike. <laughs> yeah. Robo Paul is what they call him now. Robo Paul, because yeah. that was that was the uh, that theory uh, with the uh, what was it, the White Album or whatever. There was one song playing backwards, and it, when you played it forward, it sounded like. Uh, Paul is dead. Paul is dead. <laughs> and yeah, he's, this, he's this, not wearing this, shoes on the cover or whatever. <laughs> yeah, on Abbey Road. Yeah. Also, he looks completely different. But I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Steve. Hi. What's your brief history with the film The Iron Claw? Uh, Well, the year was 2023, and the movie (laughs) Iron Claw had come out in theaters on December 22nd. I think we saw it in the new year, though. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I saw it. It came out on Christmas, yeah. I didn't know very much about the backstory of the Van Buten boys or whatever they're called. Von (laughs) Eric. The Von Eric, the Van Buren boys, uh, <laughs> the right symbol, whatever. It is. Yeah, the Von Erics, um, and I didn't really want to know too much going in, lest it taint my uh, movie watching experience. Um, so I didn't look anything up, and I watched the movie, and I, I quite enjoyed it. And by enjoyed, I mean I was depressed for two and a half hours and felt really sick a lot throughout it because it's pretty heart wrenching. Yeah. Um, and then I watched it again today. That's my my brief history. That's pretty much it, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's the same for me, but I have a little bit to add to that. Um, so we, the three of us, saw it together, which was great. Uh, we had a brief conversation after, and that I think that's sort of where I developed my 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 this month. I wanted to sort of this is like the crown jewel of this wrestling month because, in my opinion, there's not a lot of wrestling movies. This might be the best wrestling movie, um, but what's interesting is I had je- when this movie. Have came you seen out, Nacho Libre? I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's the best one. <laughs> We're gonna cover the wrestlers, so like mm-hmm. maybe that's a it's an that's a Darren Aronofsky movie or a, no? A, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. So that might be like a better pound for pound film, but that'll you know we'll get there when we do. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to talk about how. Leading up to this, I watched an episode of a television program called... I'm a huge wrestling fan, I should say. That's obviously why I'm doing this. I'm the the announcer for Superkicked here in Toronto. I've gone to wrestling school. I've been a fan of professional wrestling since I was probably eight years old. All in. And leading up to this movie coming out, I was extremely excited. They were finally going to make a biopic on a real story that does have the weight of being an Oscar worthy film, which the wrestler was kind of that, but the, Randy, the Ram is a completely fictional character. He's yeah. based off of characters. He's based off of wrestling tropes, but it isn't a real thing. <coughs> mm-hmm. Now, a couple years ago, a television show comes out. It's called dark side of the ring. Okay. Jason Eisner created it. Who he, Jason Eisner is known for making Hobo with a Shotgun and a couple other indie flicks. He's from my hometown, Halifax, as well. And he created this show called Dark Side of the Ring, and he put out this 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 episode called Confidential: The Last of the Von Erichs. And in that, he outlines the Von Erich family um, because of the one surviving member, who of course is Kevin Von Erich in this. And you get you get to sort of hear the story of the Von Erichs like told from his own mouth. Okay. Shortly after I watched that, a couple years later, um, there's this podcast called Behind the Bastards. If you're listening, to, if you're watching this, you're probably familiar with it. They basically take evil men, evil men and women from history, and sort of like break down 
why they were so shitty and evil. Mm -hmm. They cover people like, I think they've even done like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and stuff too. Like, you know what I mean? But there's a five part series on Vincent Kennedy McMahon, who is very much in the news right now. You, 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 if you know, you know, he was the, the disgraced former owner of the WWE. Now he's, you know, just so many horrible things have come out about him. But right before all that, he stuff, basically looks like Homelander. <laughs> if you yeah, know, if you put him in a Homelander costume; it would be appropriate. <laughs> the Vince McMahon. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, behind the bastards did a five-part, like I guess, expose on his whole life and times. And during one of them, they were like, "Side note: Fritz von Erich and the von Erich family. This is the perfect time to talk about it because Fritz von Erich was a very similar man to Vince McMahon." And in this movie, we see why they treat a, they he treated his kids like shit. He mm. everything he touched turned to shit. There's the Von Eric curse, this and this and that. Yeah. Um, and what's great is that tells the exact story of this movie. This movie has a couple things missing. There's yeah. a whole brother they omitted. <laughs> the, the, the writer yeah. decided not to include the other the the brother who had asthma and brittle brittle bones, be, and then also killed himself because it was like. That happened right before Carrie Von Eric killed himself, and yeah. this movie is already fucked. This movie is already so depressing. <laughs> yeah, he didn't want to Jenga. T I read an article on GQ that was like he didn't want a Jenga tower of depression to just hamstringing everybody in the audience in the theater. So it would have it would have made people leave. Yes, <laughs> people yeah, have left it, the theater. They've been like, this, this can't be real. It's yeah. already it not be real. It's yeah, already a lot. Um, yeah. for a two hour and 10 minute runtime to put another 15 minutes in about how this other brother and this other brother really wanted to be a wrestler. So the, the musician character is sort of an amalgamation of two brothers. That's why yeah. when he gets injured, it's sort of like he has like an arm problem that doesn't go right. And anyway, we'll get to that when we talk about the movie. So this movie comes out, I see it. And unfortunately, unlike Steve, it was kind of tainted for me. Um, it's an object. It's objectively, objectively a good movie, but objectionably. Because, <laughs> but because I I knew the story inside and outside from being a wrestling fan and from seeing two very good, uh, better tellings of the story, I'm gonna have some things to say in my final thoughts about that. Yeah, I remember when we left the theater, you were like, "Eh, it was all right," and I was like, "What?" I was like wiping tears away from my eyes. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Whatever you say. Whatever you say. Man. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I did want to just get. It. I wanted to include all that in my brief history because okay. that's what the brief history segment is for. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to have to be constantly talking about. Oh, I saw this. I saw that throughout it. So now that you have that knowledge about me, I'm sort of a like. It's like when we did Weird Al Month, and I'm sort of like. A I'm so like glad a, you picked this month. A dictionary, like, except for maybe that last movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of a, like a walking wrestling dictionary right so um th this will be fun i think to talk you mean about. encyclopedia i do i don't know the difference apparently <laughs> i know all the wrestling words buddy yeah better look at the dictionary the encyclopedia <laughs> anyway uh, i know what I ring his bell means yeah i want to get that out of the way just so i know i know what suck it means it wasn't suck it created suck by it. wrestling i remember yeah, that in the generation grade running around i'm a wrestling thesaurus that's mm -hmm. right drew <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Drupal <laughs> wants to shout out Hulk Hogan and Mr. Mom, which is an 11 out of 10, of course. And I'm a wrestling disorder. I don't know if I've ever seen that movie, to be honest. Mr. Mom? I get it confused with another one of the same era. Because he was in a lot of movies at that point, right? And, like, I didn't Mr. really... I didn't Mr. Really Mom with Michael Keaton? Keaton? No, yeah. Mr. Mom is Michael Keaton. Mr. Nanny is... Oh, Mr. Nanny? Is, yeah. is, is it called Mr. Nanny? Yeah, right? It's not just called, like, The Nanny or something? No, it's Mr. Nanny, 1993 film starring. <laughs> name. Like, we have to be very clear that this is a man, Hulk Hogan, like, holding two children by their ankles or whatever on the cover. Yeah, it's him. Yeah, it's him holding. Yeah, there's a bunch of covers for it, but it's Hulk Hogan, mm -hmm. Madeline Zima, who was in a bunch of stuff in the 90s as a little kid, David Johansson of uh, the New York City Dolls is the bad guy, and Sherman Hemsley is like just there being like, I'm Sherman Hemsley. I yell. I do yelling. <laughs> Right. Um, there, there, there it is. Wow. And I think that's the one where Hulk where Hulk Hogan's driving on his motorcycle and somebody just throws a dog into the Yeah. 
Oh, isn't Chris there a Clipper? movie where Hulk Hogan is also secretly an alien and like at the end he like with that's, Christopher Lloyd? Yeah, that's Suburban Commando. That's real, right? I didn't dream. That's real. That. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, it is real. So I think I've mentioned it before when I was a kid, I was babysat by these really irresponsible like dirtbag people when I was a kid. <laughs> Oh, was it Hulk Hogan? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was Mr. <laughs> Nanny himself. But like, they would just throw us in the basement with their kids, and they just—that's where I saw uh, the Evil Dead at the <laughs> age at the age of four years old. Was because Ooh. these. Yeah, I should not have watched the Evil Dead when I was four <laughs> years. I thought it was not a real movie for a long time, and that my brain had just. Cr- yeah, didn't you get? It, don't you have life. it like Ghostbusters and the Evil Dead? Well, it's like because the they would they would had? let their kids watch anything, right? So it was like they, we watched Ghostbusters two, we watched the Evil Dead, we watched Suburban Commando, and all these movies horrified me because I was too young to watch any of them. And so for years, I thought that Ghostbusters was as frightening as the Evil Dead. I mean, the Evil Dead now is kind of comical to watch when you know what's going on, but it's so gruesome and gory as a child. Yeah. Ten times scarier than Ghostbusters would be or would have been. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Anyway, so Suburban Commando, I was like, I didn't know that that was a real movie for a long time. And I and even up to the just a few moments ago, I was not fully con- <laughs> like I, I was not fully aware that it was real and that maybe I had made it up and also thought that it was Mr. Nanny. <laughs> like, is there a scene in Mr. Nanny where he's a secret alien? I was a nanny today. <laughs> Anyway. It's funny that in, Sur- Sur- in Suburban Commando, I had it on. Uh, I had didn't have the movie, but I had the trailer before the f- original Ninja Turtles on VHS. Yeah, I saw the trailer for it like a thousand times. Yeah, I just remember Christopher Lloyd gets frozen, and Hulk Hogan's driving down the street with him in like a convertible, like yeah. I think maybe shooting. And later in the movie, he goes, "I was frozen today," like yeah. like uh, like Doc Brown. Yeah. And uh, that was that was a th- thing I remember from my kids' childhood. Mm-hmm. My child kids. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, was that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles two? That VHS? Uh, yeah, Turtles two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You guys talking about the secret of the ooze? I secret am, of yeah, the ooze. There, that goo. I'm gonna tell you right now, not enough ooze, not enough secrets in that. Movie. <laughs> no, Baxter Stockman's immediately like these. Uh, these everything's big because of the mutagen. Yeah. <laughs> Look Wait at these daddy lions. He's They're wacky. The, he's giving away the secret right away. <laughs> <laughs> no more then, secrets left. Then they don't even turn him into a big. They don't even turn him into a big uh, fly man. A big house fly man. Yeah, I mean, that classic Vanilla Ice moment. Yeah, I feel like those movies weirdly tried to to distance themselves from the comic books and the cartoon show in a way that was not necessarily beneficial to the movie. They're like, we're going to create our own monsters, and it's like, why don't you just use a pig and a another weird, you know. And what and a wild boar or, or yeah, they, in the uh, and a rhino, and a rhino, right? yeah. This movie's already exactly like the TV show at the time. Why can't they just do? Maybe they didn't want to have uh, weird prosthetics, more weird prosthetics. Uh, but they had talk. two other monsters, like they. <laughs> the they, they, they make a werewolf and a, another turtle. A snapping yeah. turtle. The, Toka and Razor, Razor don't uh, talk, <laughs> but maybe they didn't want more prosthetic oh. for talking animals. Oh, right. Well, It'll actually, be- they did talk because they called Shredder Mama. Oh, yeah, that's true. Mama. Yeah, but that's a really easy puppet <laughs> movement. <laughs> say, what do you mean? What do you mean, Shredder? You want us to go through some turtle You got to have some real articulation. Do you want a very good representation of the Ninja Turtles? ironically enough uh ca- cartoon the ninja turtles 2 movie from like modern days has everybody in it bebop rocksteady krang shredder they all look crazy well i, I still haven't seen the newest one the, the mm-hmm. animated one that came out i'd like to see that though. also good that has yeah. every villain in the ninja turtles rogues gallery in it which i really mm-hmm. appreciated i remember when we were like or when i was like uh 10 or 11 a new t- uh teenage ninja turtles like live action tv show came out and they added like a venus a, was her name her name was venus right yeah. mm-hmm. which i'm like couldn't they have found a real artist and not a work of art so venus her? was a work of art yeah sorry that's what you were saying yeah yeah, yeah. Not, like they could have been like they could have called her like yoko like yoko ono <laughs> 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 The, the epitome of art. Yes. <laughs> There's no such thing as female <laughs> Renaissance artists. Okay. I'm sure there were. <laughs> they probably <laughs> yeah. just they probably just went by male names. Yeah. I was yeah. just gonna say probably that. Yeah. Michelangelo is canonically, historically, a woman. 
They, anyway, that's our brief maybe history. Maybe they went I guess. with Venus, as in like Vincent, like Vincent Van Gogh or something. But I, I don't think that he was Renaissance. No, he wasn't. Yeah, he, he was. He, he was like modern. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's not talk about this anymore because I don't want to expose how little I know about art history. Sure the <laughs> as, an <artist. laughs> as an artist. Yeah. Let's do a little director <laughs> talk because there's not much to say about this guy. Mm -hmm. There's not much to say about Sean Durkin. No. Timothy Sean Durkin. My name is Timothy Von Jerkin. <laughs> That's my name. Don't wear it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think this is like one of his only movies. Let's shoot this piece of shit. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Yeah, sorry. All right, all right. Quiet on set. Are we rolling? Okay, let's shoot this piece of shit. Speed. Sound. Speed. Action. When Steve was like, I'm going to do the sounds now, I was nervous, but not because I don't think you can do it, just because like you're learning how much I was doing during the right. show. Pump your fucking brakes. Pal. No, but I just, I just mean <laughs> like, it, there's a, you know. I need time to get into a flow. And like, yes. I know we're, we've just been, since we got this new platform, it's a, it's, it's a little bit, I, I get too ahead of myself in my thoughts and then I forget that I'm supposed to be doing sound effects. It's all good, <laughs> man. I, that's exactly what I was trying to say. You're doing a great um, job. Anyway, this guy, uh, he hasn't made, I think this is his only movie. And I gotta say. It's his fourth. A bit, I mean, like for, is that came out in theater, like two of them are shorts. Mercy, mm -hmm. Martha, one of Mercy them is a movie, May, but I don't know if it's theatrically released. Yeah, Dead Ringers is TV. A bunch yeah. of them are TV. <clears throat> the Nest. He he's a producer on a bunch of stuff, but also nothing really of note. I must say though, like for being such a prestige project, it it's pretty impressive. Like considering he has good. such a little filmography, you you would expect him to have like four or five heavy hitters under his. Under his belt. Look at all these wrestling. This is uh, his breakout thing, I guess. He's going to probably mainstream goes. Yeah, it's going to win something next Oscars. I'm sure. You know what I mean? Like maybe sound design. Maybe it came who knows? out. It came out in 2023. Man, the Oscars are over. No, the next. It'll be part of the next Oscars because no, it, it won't. Didn't... Yeah, well, did, did they not last include... year? 20, 2023's Oscars are done. No, but there's a cutoff. It'll be in the next Oscar. Are you sure about this? Yeah, because it came out at Christmas time. I, yeah, I, I, I believe that's the case. I also hate the Oscars in, in general, though. Yeah, because, yeah. Um, Fair. yeah I, 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 and also things like um, <clears throat> uh, online reviewers like um, Rotten Tomatoes. I, I, I'm not a fan of those, but uh, look eight, it, though. I, I still check them out because it yeah for sure but I, I don't like how they dictate how well some movies will and won't do but listen to this yeah from, from my from my point of view from my standpoint if this mm -hmm. movie wins any Oscars yeah the floodgates of wrestling biographies open and I get all kinds of shit there's already a Hulk Hogan movie that coming down the pike that I think they were waiting to, to gauge how this does to finish it there's supposed to be a Vince McMahon movie but he's a uh, the worst sex pervert possibly in the history of of cinema, in the in the history of uh, entertainment, maybe P Diddy's worse. Vince McMahon pretty bad. I don't know if that movie's ever. He's not a wrestler. No, I'm just kidding. No, in entertainment, like you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Vince McMahon and P Diddy kind of like got me too at the same time, and me too is not the way to put that. They no. got canceled and obliterated from the history. Or just, you know what would be the appropriate word would be exposed for their horrible crimes. Exposed for the horrible crimes. <laughs> I no, really don't like when people are like, oh, he got me too, because it makes it sound like you're some you're you're not taking it as seriously as like, no, right. his his horrible, horrible crimes are exposed to the world. He got yeah. uh I think canceled is a little bit too too light of a word now, too. So the whole so canceled exposed... infers that you can come back from yes. crimes that you've committed, but like Mm -hmm. I think that exposed like this is like Cosby level shit. You know, it's like, absolute. Both of them are Cosby level exposures. Yeah, we yeah. can't say they got Bill Cosby though because that has a different connotation. <laughs> anyway, that said, uh, yeah, this whole episode is going to get canceled. Sean mm. Durkin, uh Yes, you're right. But my point is that if this movie wins, I know I agree with you. The Oscars are whatever. Like whatever yeah. Cares. But if they if wins, it's going to win Golden Globes. It's going to win Oscars, even mm -hmm. I think. And then when it does, we're going to see a bunch of these ranging in quality biopics. Yeah. Lots of them can be like this. I really want to see what they do with the Hulk Hogan movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> and I wanted to see what they did with the Vince McMahon movie. But from what I understand is the Vince McMahon movie was going to be very hands-on from Vince McMahon. Yeah. Which means it was going to be 100% fiction. And yeah. Show him in a positive light. Now he would have, he would have literally Net- been wearing the Homelander outfit the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Now we're going to get a Netflix miniseries about Vince McMahon, and that's very oh, different. Yeah. You don't want that. It's going to start with no. like, ding, ding. And then, <laughs> that thing of him, you know, he's like walking out, and he looks like he's <laughs> one of those robots where they figured out how to make them walk normally. <laughs> like the, the Boston Mechanics Lab robots that, like, for a while they were really wobbly. <laughs> Just have a bunch of engineers kick him around. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you, you are right about um, uh, the Oscars and things like it help uh, mainstream certain things. And for wrestling stories, like uh, my big introduction to the darker side of things for wrestling was um, Beyond the Mat, that documentary that features Jake the Snake. Because uh, I was also a big wrestling fan as a kid. Uh, I, I, I remember losing my mind when Coco Beware would come on to, to do a match and all that kind of yeah. stuff. But uh, uh, but like this movie for like this this being the first big movie for this director and to have like his cinematic voice fully realized and I mean that's without really taking a good strong look at like director photography and editor and all that kind of stuff and seeing what their body of work is like but it's still like as far as the the look of the movie the editing the pacing. And this movie is like what two and a half hours long or something. Yeah, two oh five. It's very very well paced for for how much happens in it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the last like forty eight hours I've watched Oppenheimer, The Whale, and The Iron Claw, mm-hmm. and I, I'm having a little bit of like prestige filmmaking overload where I'm like, I need to watch something with <laughs> cardboard sets that are. I need like, to watch Batman and with... Robin. No, no, I'm I'm talking. I need to watch something that is like a sci fi original like. <laughs> Great to TV movie. I'm not, I don't even the Transformators or something. Or... <laughs> yeah, something. I need to watch the whole Asylum films. Fucking. I need to watch something that has like a retired actor from the late seventies, early eighties coming out of retirement ah. to make like a short cameo at the beginning as a general or yeah. something. You are one step away from a Roger Corman film. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I, what I what I mean to say is like. The whale I did not like, and we're not gonna we, let's not talk about it too much. But Oppenheimer I did like, but it had this really weird pacing to it, where there are these long and very, very often, and like they would co- they would come up maybe every like ten five between five and fifteen minutes, you'd get a long montage that's accompanied by very intense music and Oppenheimer's like way he sees the world, mixed with things happening, like information you're meant to digest and and. Uh, absorb Mm -hmm. and it's so intense and it it happens so often that you it kind of takes you out of the movie a little bit and the same thing happens in this movie only it's it's everything is so deliberate and important and everything you're seeing it's not like shoe leathery you know Mm -hmm. um and i'm not saying that open oppenheimer was but there's it's almost like they try and shove five years of stuff happening in oppenheimer into your mind within you know a 30 second to two minute period whereas this they they pair it with with fights, you know, it's, it's so smart the way you're, you're getting very important information emotionally from the characters that's paired with these really yeah. well choreographed and re- really well shot fight sequences. Um, and it, it just works so incredibly well. And, and they also, you know, they choose likable music stuff that most people are fam- familiar with so that you're kind of like toe tapping to it the entire time. Uh, and, and it's all often very like off shot by, the the horrible stuff that's happening in the movie that you're you're feeling sick about yeah you're you're trying to die you're trying to process that and then you're also given these these really good uh visuals to to help kind of like take the medicine i guess to to to, to get to the next horrifying thing and it just horrifying thing after horrifying thing happen it happens to to poor kevin in this movie it's yeah. mostly from his perspective it's i think it's safe to call him the main character of this movie though it is very much like an ensemble film where yeah. everybody's got their moment. He's the, he's the thread from the beginning to the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, maybe I'm, I'm kind of getting off director talk now. I'm just kind of getting into the structural stuff of the film. So we can, we can move on if you'd like, or we can keep talking about this guy. Well, I think I, he's a good filmmaker. I want to see what yeah. he does next, to be honest. Yes. The only other thing I wanted to cover in this little bit was that he is Canadian. <laughs> 
<laughs> I just want to mention yeah. that, which is interesting. And uh, I wanted to give a shout out to like how he, except except for the Ric Flair portrayal, which we'll talk about, which has been pulled apart online. A lot of the other portrayals in the movie who pulled apart by who though? Like who's pulling that performance? Like, people oh. like me. Hardcore oh, would have been exactly the same as Ric Flair. <laughs> oh, but the thing okay. is, is a lot of the a lot of the performances in this and a lot of the likenesses of the characters they got were pretty spot on. Ironically, um, I'm looking at a side by side picture of the real uh, Kevin Von Erich and Zac Efron. Zac Efron looked more like Kevin Von Erich when he wasn't a big Roydy Magoo freak. Which is they both had kind of baby faces. Well, that's when probably he, why they hired him. And then he's like, I gotta get into crazy wrestling shape for this yeah. movie, and then went a little bit too far. It's like when Chris Hemsworth got the role of Thor, they did his measurements, and then he went out for six months before filming and came back and they're like, This costume is too small. We gotta make the costume bigger now. It doesn't fit on his body. It'd be great if it ended up being too big for him. <laughs> yeah. But the uh the guy they got for Harley Race is um was probably one of the best things I've ever seen. And I just wanted to give another shout out to uh, the, one of the executive producers on this movie, MJF, Maxwell Jacob Friedman, who does have a cameo in this that they mostly cut out. Uh, he plays a cousin of the Von Eric named Lance Von Eric, who mm -hmm. didn't have the curse. Uh, that's probably why they didn't focus on him because he also survived. <laughs> And but uh, I can't he, wait to talk about the curse, but yeah, okay. he put together he he was one of the reasons why this movie got put together, and uh, he's one of the best wrestlers today, and he's one of the mo the closest modern wrestlers to be at a real like Ric Flair, where oh he he's like plays a rich guy, and then outside of wrestling, he still acts like that. Um, so I just wanted to say that like they did a good job with incorporating wrestlers into this. Because they could have easily just had nobody at all, no wrestlers at all in this. It could have made it so much worse. Um, Chavo Guerrero, who's in who's, who was in wrestling forever, he's part of the Guerrero family. Eddie Guerrero, who you may have heard of, was his brother or his cousin or brother or something. I can't remember right the second, but he does a lot of the <clears throat> he trains actors how to wrestle. So he would have trained all of these actors how to do all the actors how to do their bits, and in a lot of scenes, you never really see a re an actor wrestling an actor because you need a wrestler to sort of help mm -hmm. you through the choreography. And I think that's important. I think directing wise, um, Sean did a good job at making it feel really real because he he clearly either loves wrestling or has a great respect for it. Same with uh, Zac Efron. Clearly he has a great respect for it. And I appreciate that because I've seen when they don't care. And as much as I like glow, great TV show, nobody fucking knew what they were doing. Nobody really knew how to wrestle. It was more focused on the <clears throat> interpersonal drama. Wrestling mm -hmm. came second. And then inversely, like, uh, heels went a little bit too far the other way where they were just like trying to hit a mainstream audience with wrestling terminology that just goes over everybody's head mm -hmm. but uh anyway this this is a good middle ground of of presenting professional wrestling to a a wide audience but with that yeah. why don't we move along to the sexual body of this episode Ooh. Ho, 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 ho. everybody back up because here comes the body of the episode. Ooh. And what a body is it? Holy La. smokes. La. Nobody's that vascular when they get out of bed. <laughs> Flexing in his sleep. Yeah. It's true. Mm. And uh, that's, how, gonna... that's how Kevin Von Eric sleeps. He sleeps like just constantly doing sit ups. He's like, he's doing, it. <laughs> doing those sit ups where you also like crunch your legs too. Yeah. Mm. Um, I am just going to hit this right quick because of how fast it happens. But uh, that's when they said the name of the movie in the movie. They say the name of this movie about a 400 times during the movie. It's one of those. Not as bad as Roadhouse. We watched the first half of Roadhouse on vacation and they say <laughs> Roadhouse 35 <laughs> times a second. But they do say the Iron Claw a lot. And we will never bring up Roadhouse on this podcast <laughs> right. again. Until we cover it when I do Roadhouse Month 
<laughs> for my birthday next year. Yeah. Uh, you should call it house trip Mon- month and you do roadhouse and road trip movies only. Exactly. <laughs> and I just do roadhouse, roadhouse, Euro trip, road trip. <laughs> and then the roadrunner movie. Yeah. Or just call it the crossroads um, month. Yeah, and do a crossroads <laughs> from Justin to Brittany or whatever it was called. Oh, God. Sorry. <laughs> I think that was two different movies. Anyway, my point is that three minutes and 20 seconds, they say the Iron Claw because it's the flashback to the past mm-hmm. where Fritz von Erich is the wrestlers in black and white, which is a, a touch that I mm, sometimes don't like, but I liked it in this. Mm-hmm. He is, he wants to be the NWA champion. NWA is the National Wrestling Alliance. Uh, something that he never gets because I don't think the curse is a curse. I think that these people no, all suck. We'll get into it as we know. He's the, he is definitely the curse of the family. Yeah. But yes. I, I do think that this um, opening is. I think it's also supposed to be an homage to the Raging Bull. Tim, I don't know if you, if you agree yes. with me. Um, I, I I can see that too. Yeah. With, with especially with compared to um, like late seventies, eighties, and nineties wrestling, where it got a lot more colorful not just visually literally but like in depictions and characterization where uh, people are taking on very different personas almost taking notes from like luchadore type stuff Mm -hmm. whereas for a long time it was just kind of like the strong men uh from the circus wrestling each other type thing and it evolved into this big stage theater uh production and 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 i was just just gonna say if you go back far enough wrestling started in like lumberjack yards where it was basically like who can beat up this guy. And then a little bit after that, somebody was like, we can monetize this by like fixing it and putting it in the circus. And then that professional wrestling, as we know it a hundred years later, and it hasn't really changed. And there's that section, like you're talking about Tim, where it was literally just the strong guy from one town goes to another town to fight the strong man of that town. Mm -hmm. And they talk it out beforehand and wrestling matches in Fritz von Erich's time didn't have the glitz and glam that it has now. There were no characters, like you said. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was literally, like, holds. It was very much derived from amateur wrestling. Holds. And then they introduced, like, the body slam and the fucking headlock. Yeah, and right. it's like... I, even if you just look at the music that they play in this scene and throughout the movie, it's very much meant to, like, evoke... Uh, gladiatorial movies from the golden era of, of cinema and yeah. they take that throughout everything in the movie like when they're playing the the promos for the villains in the movie like uh race and um flair it's it's got this like slow build as it pushes in on onto the television with this these like triumphant and evil sounding trumpets kind of like you know it's like a, a, a rolling storm looming over the the, the von eric family which yeah. is like like this is part of the curse, but but really, like no, it's not. The curse is is coming from inside the house, kind of thing, right? Yeah, this 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 grand dysfunction as the pageantry builds. Yeah, uh, but the the black and white uh, uh, beginning of it uh, 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 is also like much like in Raging Bull, where when they're in the ring and, and fighting their matches, it's like they're tuning things out and like color yeah. kind of fades out. Because I I don't know if this was something intentional, but you can kind of see as well that there's an immediate crowd around the stage and then it gets very empty. And then you can kind of see a crowd in the stands in the, in the background of it all. But there's yeah, kind of like, it's not much. Like, it's supposed to be like tunnel vision almost, right? Like he's, he's so focused yeah. on what's happening in the ring. And that, that goes again throughout the movie where he's, he's, he's a very shitty person, but he's got, he's got this crazy focus that it's so laser beamed that he doesn't, pay attention to anything outside of that focus right including his own family and uh we're also getting a lot of character notes even from just this one sequence right like once the once the music fades and and the the sound effects kind of pull inward you hear that the crowd is is booing him and Mm -hmm. he's he's kind of feasting on it right and he's putting his hands up and being like i'll snap his fucking neck or whatever yeah he's he's to kill this guy because like they, they don't outright say it, but I believe Fritz von Erich was back in the day, as, as the term goes, heel. He, he was a wrestling villain. Because hmm. I think the idea of the Fritz von Erich name originally was like to evoke Nazi Germany right. type stuff. Right. Um, so so yeah, yeah yeah absolutely and his double bad. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, and in, in the movie, his offstage persona matches that in many ways, but that 
beginning of where it opens up with him just stomping his opponent down. Yeah. And it's like, this is going to be the rest of the movie, him stomping other people down. Yeah. And, and, and in my opinion, he is the iron claw that he, and, and when he's demonstrating the iron claw to people, he's pushing people down. He's, and, and he's oppressive and opposing to everybody else. Yeah. I will say that um, Stu Hart, Bret Hart's father, suggested the Von Erich name to Fritz because Fritz at some point was a Nazi wrestling character, mm -hmm. which was much more widely accepted uh, back then. Um, yeah. It's been suggested to wrestlers over the years. There's been KKK wrestlers. There's been all kinds of gross shit. Yeah. Uh, right up to the 90s where there was an idea to have kind of like a reverse Captain America where the gimmick would be like this guy was frozen since World War II. Mm -hmm. And in 1991, a Nazi would come emerging from the back from the back to right. sort of hate the, the black I think that, you know, and there Jewish was a, wrestlers. There was mm -hmm. a time period not that long ago where these types of caricatures you could do them because they were, because they were so ridiculous because no one would take them seriously. And it's like, look at this cartoon character coming from the past. Isn't mm -hmm. that funny? Whereas now we're, we're starting to realize like, Oh shit, like these people still exist and still are like in places of power and it's frightening. And so for you to, if, if someone was to come forward with a character like that, now we'd be like, no, thank you. <laughs> Please get out of here. Cause nobody weirdos, needs or wants this. Yeah. Weirdos would be like, they'd get, they'd get it wrong. Like they do with Homelander. Like they do with, it's always sunny. They just yep. get the wrong, like they do with a lot of movies like Scarface. And, and uh, I think that uh, very creative people who are really Club, smart sometimes give American the benefit Psycho. of the doubt to the masses and the unfortunate reality is that there's a lot of stupidity in the masses that you don't take into consideration when you're making something that's so ridiculous. You're mm -hmm. like, this is so ridiculous, no one will take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is going to take what you've done at, at a subtext level. They're going to take it at face value. And if they like it at face value, then there's something wrong with those people. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I think we're getting a little bit too serious here. Let's, let's, let's move back to... <laughs> so Fritz yeah. is like, I'm going to be the NWA champion one day, and we need to buy a house. So what I've done is I've bought a new car. Wait, wait, wait. We have, to, we have to talk about the actor. The actor. The man who plays Fritz. I was going to um, mention Ma Mario Tyranny, but this guy... This well, guy Holt, Holt up, right? Mc, 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 uh Holt McCallany, yeah. McCallany, he, pardon me. He's a... Uh, he basically looks like an N64 character. Like he's very, <laughs> he's very blocky. <laughs> yes. He, like, he's, okay. he's, he's got a blockhead uh, on him. He's For, a, he was in fight club too. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. in a lot of stuff. And he's in 80 things. So yeah, he's been around. So mm -hmm. like, I think his performance in this movie is, is quite good. And I do like him in that first, that opening sequence. I, there's something about him though, that, like I'm in no way saying that he's a bad bad actor because I think that he is quite a good actor, but his presence is almost like ninety percent in his voice and and the way he speaks, and then you know there's there's not much else going on in terms of I mean he's an imposing figure he's he's quite intimidating looking because he's a basically a cube like, a cube. <laughs> like he's a, he's got a square head and a square body yeah he's got a barrel for a torso and then a smaller barrel on top of of that. Yeah, um, and, but like his voice is is extremely powerful. It, it's almost like I feel like he should be in every voice acting performance somewhere. Like he should be in in everything somehow. Yeah, um, but that's not to say that his performance is bad in this because I think it's it's quite powerful. And you know, we get our first Fritz speech in the moments that you're talking about here, Jason, where he's talking about the car, and we yeah. get so many Fritz speeches throughout this yeah, movie where he just get, lays it out. Here's how it is. It's and... like, he's just constantly got speeches going in his head all the yeah. time, just in case he needs to, to whip one out to like inspire he... confidence or, uh, have some sort of detrimental iron, iron claw, pull you down to the depths of, of depression. <laughs> yeah. Um, Do you know who he reminds me of in a very weird, non-ironic way? The dad from, um, the Dewey Cox story, walk hard. It's like the wrong boy died. He reminds me of I was going like, to say the dad from Talladega Nights, another movie or, that yeah. is very similar. If you're not first, you're last. That's the it's whole like, speech when they're in the car is basically yeah. if you're not first, you're last. And I was like, yeah. oh my God. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a weird like 
he, he's that character where he's the giant. Like, you know, I've seen. <laughs> I literally wrote in my notes this is a real if you ain't first, you're last mentality. <laughs> <laughs> I I that. He reminds me of those, like, when I was a kid growing up, a dad, you go over to like somebody's house and their weird dad who's not around very much would come storming in yelling about something. Yeah. And you're like, I'm a neighbor kid. I'm a neighborhood kid. Why am I getting yelled at by this six foot, this nine blockhead, fucking yeah. crazy man's man and that's a big problem that these these young boys faced growing up that this guy this dad has like unchecked rage issues and and depression and cte from being dropped on his head and then that's passed down to the kids because they often become wrestlers they started wrestling when they were probably eight years old one thing that like is kind of curious is they never show any kind of signs of physical abuse from the father right like it's all pure emotional emotional and mental abuse Mm -hmm. where like i i don't know enough about the story like the actual story like did he physically abuse them i don't know but from what i see from the movie if they added that in there it probably would have been even more difficult to to digest and we have that time jump where it's like they're little kids all the way up into the they're all full grown men who could probably kick the shit out of the him if they really needed to. As as they do kind of later show and yeah. <laughs> Kevin almost fucking strangles him to death. Yeah. But but it speaks to the emotional trauma of it where he does have this hold on the whole family, not just the kids. Um uh, uh where he's he's the authority and it's like and and it's funny you mentioned that um you know, like everyone kind of remembers growing up seeing one of those dads. Uh, I, I, that's one thing that I thought was well accomplished by this movie is that even though we're talking about something that most people do not live with, where it's like a, the, the professional wrestling lifestyle and how intense and extreme it is, but there's elements in here that are very, very familiar that we can kind of see and understand, even if we haven't experienced it necessarily ourselves, we can associate with this. Uh, and and at times like it, it, it's almost, it, it almost comes off as a little like, this can't be real. This is so silly uh, to be so over the top. Like the idea of him straight up saying to them at the breakfast table, you're my favorite. He's second, he's third. He's like, he's constantly listing the rankings of his own children yeah. uh, to them. And not uh, just and, at home. He does it in front of a national audience at one point as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and it doesn't it doesn't even move the needle for any of them. They've heard no. this before. Right. But yeah. this is also like he's the I'm kind of guy. Three. Yeah. He's mm-hmm. the kind of guy that would also say things like autism doesn't exist. When it's like clearly you have autism, man. <laughs> you have autism. Yeah. yeah. He's, <laughs> he's ranking his children in front of them. He he sees everything as a competition, right? Like everything is we yeah. need to move. We need to make a move now in order for us to get to this position, so that we can get to this position, so that we can get to this position. Yeah, so like it, it a, is implied that he's a he's very smart as well, right? Like he's he's not a fool, but he has absolutely no way of not to jump ahead too much. But even when they he realizes like we need to 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 make one of you the world champion now, which one is it going to be? And they both want to do it it's like rather than make a logical choice, he, he flips, he flips a, a, a coin. coin. Right. And it's like, yeah, he it's has very... absolutely no way of, of having emotional connection to them on a, on a real, he's like, you know, I love you, but I'm not going to express why or how, or in any, or tell you more than, than once in your whole you. life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and no crying aloud. And yeah, it's yeah. a very common thing in wrestling too, where, failed ba- failed football players will end up in wrestling because they can't do anything else no and when you fail at you also fail at wrestling it's a that's a, pr- a big thing a lot of wrestlers have come through that were failed football players and just couldn't hack it because it's a different sport and it's a different thing and it's fake it's it's uh, not fake per se it's like it's a choreographed uh, dance. Oh, there's a scene it, in this movie that I think articulates it so perfectly, which I think we'll get to when we get to it. But the ex- the explanation of like the difference between fake and what wrestling actually is, I think yeah. in this movie for a layman who like, because I think there's like a snooty look down your nose behavior oh, wrestling's fake. attitude like... that people have about wrestling that is like, it's foolish 
And like I've said it before when I was like 14 or 15 being like, well, wrestling's fake. But it's like, obviously, it's fucking fake. What do you think that people like actually dress up like a fucking samurai? And I actually and, think like, that I'm and... <laughs> an undertaker who has mystical power. I've come back from the dead. And <laughs> buried alive, no problem. Be back on Monday Night Raw. Yeah. And the thing about WWE, even it's like a lot of people have said that that's it's not necessarily wrestling it's rest a wrestling show about wrestlers and then you watch other wrestling companies that are presented more like a sport and they're a different thing so wrestling even there has so many different flavors real wrestling is boring and kind of sexual and, to watch. Yeah. well real wrestling the the sideways evolution of that is basically just mma and mma also is kind of boring I'm talking about olympic wrestling if you go to the olympics and watch yes. wrestling that's yeah. real wrestling and it's not really that entertaining and each match lasts like 45 seconds <laughs> like it's yeah. not entertaining at all yeah uh, i mean i'm sure it's entertaining to some people but i mean to me it's like like i had to do a wrestling unit in gym when i was in high school and it was just like it felt so weird and like odd to me right but, but mm -hmm. then like some people were really good at it and loved it but I'm like, I have no interest in this. It feels I violent feel like and strange, and I don't amateur like style wrestling, Greco Roman style wrestling, as it's known. Um, is that's when you do it naked, though, right? That's when you do it with a <laughs> yeah. loincloth, Greek and style. <laughs> but that, that kind of wrestling is more like that's a real sport, quote unquote. Well, not even quote unquote, it's a real sport, and I think it's more fun to do or more, more in the um, nude. To do in the nude. No, it's yes. more fun to do than it is to watch for that very reason. The reason why I don't like uh, MMA that much. Like I, I'll watch it, but it's I'm not I'm not one of those people that's analyzing each little no. thing. I also don't like watching people get like head maimed. Trauma. Yeah, <laughs> and it head so hard that you know their brain is probably what was, damaged. What I was gonna say is professional wrestling is two men take each other's lives into each other's hands and do these incredibly acrobatic feats that emulate a fight that two people couldn't have in real life it's more yeah. like you're watching superheroes fight or you're playing with your action figures or, or like yeah. this LA or something where it's like yeah. this highly practiced and choreographed thing yeah like i think we all get it it's just like the attitude of like i said people looking down their nose at it as this sort of like subhuman form of entertainment is that they just don't really care to look into it more than that and i think but that, i feel that way about baseball or hockey right? that's what i'm like, saying you know that's, I mean? that's the comparison we're making about all these things right yeah. um but i think that when she uh kevin's future wife in the diner when she says well isn't it all fake and he's like there's nothing fake about what we do and then he explains it as like the belt that i get is not me winning a belt because i want to fight it's me doing very well at my job and i'm getting a promotion yeah. similar to like if you do well at your job at a Home Depot, you'll be given a promotion to assistant manager and then to manager. These belts are essentially me making my way up within an organization in any in the same way you would in any company. And, and then on top of that, you become the face of the company when you're the world's champion. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, the ultimate promotion. But then you have to carry like it's it's a promotion where you be basically become the CEO. You have to carry the company on your back. You have to go do all the media appearances. You have to go out and, and sort of right. represent what the company is about. He, That's he why also, they pick the champions they do in wrestling. But he mm -hmm. also explains that like performance is not necessarily you going and kicking someone's ass. Performance is you. Get, getting the audience on your side and and having a community grow around you and and love you as a persona just yeah. in the way that you would as a celebrity in any other forum right like you need to get people to like you in order for them to want to promote you mm -hmm. and it i think it's like a really good explanation that you could give to anybody who says something like well isn't it all fake and have them listen to that and they would completely understand you immediately <laughs> they'd be like yeah. oh yeah i never thought of it that way yeah um and Which, you know, for all of us, we already knew this going in, but like to see it explained so articular, uh, articulately within the movie, I was like, oh, that's handy for, you know, the people who are going to see this as Oscar bait are going to yeah. then walk away with a new kind of perspective on what wrestling is. I've been defending wrestling pretty much my whole life, and I'm not this person who thinks it's all real. I'm not this person who like puts too much stock or time or effort into thinking about it i just watch wrestling I think we'd be, this would be an intervention if you thought that way. exactly <laughs> this would not be a podcast episode. We'd be like, Jason, we hate to break it to you <laughs> but you suspend disbelief right a lot of people make the argument that like when somebody's like you know wrestling's fake right it's like yeah so is like game of thrones do you think yeah. game of thrones is real <laughs> you yeah know what i mean 
it's just an ongoing. What are you telling me? Ending. Khaleesi, the Stormbringer, Breaker of Chains, Mother. She was of not Dragons a fictional not character. Real? Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> um, the professional wrestling is a soap opera. Yep. That has been the story of the WWE specifically has been going on since like 1981 or maybe even 79, depending on how far back you go. Yeah. And that's the thing I love about it because I can be a historian about this thing the same way people are like, I, somebody who knows everything about Spider Man's lineage and all the spin offs, right? And they know how they all connect in the fucking multiverse or whatever. Mm-hmm. That's what wrestling is to wrestling fans. The wrestling fans that aren't. Well, we all know that the multiverse of this story is that. Kevin Von Erich is actually he, Adam from Attorney. <laughs> Look at him. Yeah. He is Adam from Attorney. Look at his yeah. fucking hair. Anyway, we should yeah. get back to the plot because we've only right. gone through the first sequence of black and white. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, we, fast forward to the 70s, basically. We, we get a, a uncomfortable shot of Zac Zach Efron waking up in his tidy whities more jacked than any person has ever woke up, woken up in their lives it's crazy like, yeah. and then he's like immediately like let's go for a run to his brother his brother's like are you fucking nuts man you look like you just went for a run and did a thousand push-ups <laughs> and ate an entire pig oh that's uh, another thing in this movie a lot of eating too yeah a lot of eating a lot of wrestling see that's the thing i'm not worried about talking about too much because there's a lot of like almost full wrestling matches during the movie mm-hmm. that we don't need to like get into but they're also like i was saying before they're also cut up in a way that that there's they're telling you something within the story as well while while showing you them yeah so there's the characterization fight, with it yeah yeah the, the the wrestling matches seem longer than they actually are because you're getting something out of it as well um like this sequence here the first the the workout sequence in the morning you're getting a lot of stuff within his life even though most of it is him just running and and doing bench press it's cut up between you know the first fight we see with him um but we also see like little interesting things in the house and like they, they show a family portrait. I don't know if you guys noticed this, but like I noticed it in my second view, like nobody in the photo is smiling at all. They're like, they have like the most like dead looks on their face. Like they're upset except for Zach Efron kind of has like a little bit of like, cause he's such a doofy guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't tell if it's just his face or if like, he's just like actually not, smiling but the rest of them look up like genuinely upset to be in the photo and yeah. like you can picture after watching the entire movie you can picture fritz before the photo being like remember no smiles no smiles <laughs> like <Yeah. no> smiles. <laughs> showing emotion is weakness yeah. yeah we we also learn a little bit of stuff about them like michael von eric is like i want to be a musician and david and david and uh at, Kevin are all in on being wrestling, being a wrestling tag team. They, but then we get that nice scene of them like going for burgers and you know going down the river, all so mm. all holding each other on uh, on inner tubes. Like the, yeah. this is a close knit group. Um, and then the the next scene that I wrote down was the best scene in the movie, and that's the Kevin trying to do a promo. He keeps stumbling <laughs> over his words. Yeah, yeah, this the scene. Yeah, yeah. I think it really shows. Um, that he's uncomfortable being the face of the operation in terms of like, you know, like he's probably well better suited to be in his dad's position and training his brothers than he is to be the the face, the, the one who, who goes on TV and does these ads because he's he's uncomfortable and he, and, he, and he flubs his lines. And later in the movie, when he's trying to be threatening to race, he can't really quite get the words out to the point that his brother has to take the mic and do it for him. Right. And he gets mm-hmm. upset. Like, you should have let me talk. But it's like he, you we're struggling, bro. <laughs> like I, yeah. I had to take the mic from you. Yeah, he can't do the patter. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that scene in particular, the, this scene in the, my background here, I really love it because it's actually one of the few scenes that made me laugh afterwards. Thinking about it, because the announcer, whenever he says the name Bruiser Brody, it's the most like butter bread voice. Ever where there's like the Bruiser Burden, but it's going to be good. Chase and the next match with Bucket Bruiser Burp Burp. It was going in my head for the longest time of just Bigger Burp 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 Burp. It's called Marble Mouth and it's a real thing, right? <laughs> I get it all the time. He he has it permanently. It's great. Yeah. Um, but but I'm not too sure if he, that, uh, that announcer character, is directly lifted from a real life announcer, but it, it, he absolutely took me to those early days of watching wrestling. And when you would see, and I forget the name of that one guy who did all the interviewing 
uh, segments for WWF back in the day. You WWE. Know, you properly might be now. thinking of uh, Jim Ross. Yeah, we had like the little mustache. Um. Oh. Um. Mean Gene Okerlund. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mean. Um. So I think he's passed away at this point too. But um. Yeah, I, th- I th- But like all of the uh, wrestling characters are are great in this. I, I thought. I I actually really enjoyed. Uh, I know you mentioned people picking apart Ric Flair and stuff like that, but. I'll talk uh, about that when we get to it. There's a, yeah. I have a caveat for that. This character, uh, played by Michael Harney. Michael Harney has been in fucking so many things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he plays a character called Bill Mercer. <laughs> and Bill Mercer was a real man. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, he passed away. He's still alive. He's 98 years old. Holy fuck. Wow. Good for him. Gosh, um, he's I'm been in ninety-eight years. Yeah, <laughs> he's a he was a play-by-play man for baseball, football, basketball. He was a playgirl playmate. Is that what you said? <laughs> yep. <laughs> now at ninety-eight, at ninety-eight years, yeah. <laughs> come see my son for blah 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 blah. blah. <laughs> my but, big uh, burly bowls on page seventeen. <laughs> I liked this portrayal because <laughs> even though I didn't know who it was. I didn't know who the person that he was being was. It did represent what that character in wrestling does very well, where he's like, yeah. what were your, what are your thoughts on tonight's match? And that's <laughs> all they have to say. That's they, all they you also, have to say. <laughs> those ones also seem like they were, they were more meant to be like local yeah. know, entertainment, right? Like it was this wasn't going out across all of yeah. America. No, this was I, a, a I statewide to, thing in Texas. Yeah. I don't want to get fully into the territory system of pro wrestling, but essentially it wasn't like it is now where there's the WWE and some other companies that are slightly smaller and then local independent companies. Right. There was a territory system where, like I was saying of how, about how originally be like the big man from one company, one state goes over to the other state. Well, it kind of stayed like that all through the 70s and into the 80s before Vince McMahon came and sort of destroyed the territory system and bought up all the good wrestlers and created oh, one company. A capitalist. Exactly. So if you look at somebody like Ric Flair, Ric Flair was really big in... The Nature Boy? The Nature Boy. He was really <laughs> big in, like, the Carolinas. And then in... Uh, and then Jerry Lawler would be big in... Some, Jerry the King Lawler was huge in, like, Alabama or somewhere like that. I can't remember. Alabama. Mm-hmm. So then they would go over... And they didn't really cover this very well in this movie either because the whole the whole scene, you know, when it's like a three-on-three fight, the three wacky-looking guys versus the Von Erics, that was an epic feud that went on for years and years. The Freebirds? The Freebirds, that they were from just two different states... And they feuded because of that reason. And mm-hmm. the, the Von Erics were very old school, traditional wrestlers. The Freebirds were like these rock and roller guys who were like, we're rock and roll. You guys are rednecks. Let's I think like it on. the unfortunate reality of this movie is that like the amount of time that they cover of the life of, of Kevin Von Erich, you can't really get into the nitty gritty of those things. Yeah. It, would be, it would be too shoe leathery or it wouldn't even be shoe leathery. It, it would it would constitute its own entire story arc like, right like if they were to do a mini show. series of this yeah like yeah. then they could do that kind of stuff where you've got like a three episode arc where they deal with the the bird boys or whatever you just called them fabulous free birds uh, <laughs> michael p.s hayes <laughs> and the other two yeah <laughs> I've, I've forgotten what they look like i assume they look like mad max characters or something essentially uh, yeah and uh, uh buddy but uh terry gordy and jimmy garvin yeah mm-hmm. those are the okay. other two and you know that's not something that I would be in any way opposed to. Would be like a a mini series of like the life of of Ric Flair and like how he was a notorious booze hound or whatever, and just getting drunk all the time. He's also asking to get Vince McMahon. Um, he had a lot of issues with. Uh, no way. Are you of, uh, the Nature Boy, the guy with nineteen women waiting in his mile long limo? <laughs> <Come on. laughs> he's got he's got lizard skin boots. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> longest line, longest line, shortest ride. Space Mountain. <laughs> the thing he used to say about himself. Perfect. And I was like, does that imply that you bang as many chicks as fast as possible? Or are you just like a premature ejaculator? You don't care that people know. I'm like a hamster in the bed. Watch out. <laughs> <laughs> the answer to the question is like, why not all of the above? <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> Woo! All of the above. <laughs> 
well, that's, I was thinking about this like actually. I was thinking about the long, like the shortest line, longest longest ride, longest line, shortest ride. Thinking about that literally for like too long the other day, and I was like, what does he mean by that? Yeah, I think you're right. It just you're right. It's all of the things that it's everything you said. Yeah. Uh, I remember there was a video game. I think it was called like WCW versus NWO for the N64. And I was not huge into wrestling, but someone bought this game for me. And my friend, uh, friend of the show, Dorog, who usually comments at the end of our episodes, um, he had this game as well. And for some reason, we both just despised Ric Flair as a character without even, I didn't know much about him, but I was like, I fucking white hair, isn't hate it? this guy. <laughs> no, just the, even as like that, like the walk that he would do, I'm like yeah. Fuck this guy, he's such a piece of shit. <laughs> so I would go out of my way to kick the shit out of him as a uh, Booker T or something. Or whatever and do you want to know pick. the worst thing about Ric Flair when it comes to the wrestling element? He's not a great wrestler. No, he got. No. He would get. Don't beat let up. Ric Flair let you hear you say such. He a thing. would say the same thing. It's all. A, it's all a Kearney ruse. He would get beat up for the whole match, but since he was a heel, he'd do some. He'd do like eye poke, like low yeah. blow, and then put them in the figure four and win. He's never really been a face. He's never really been a good guy. Mm-hmm. And he I couldn't. Mean, everybody loves a heel, though, right? They keep people like back. to get a asshole get beaten up. Is yeah. why Ric Flair is so popular. Yeah. By the big face, by the big good guy, and it's always so... good when a heel goes, heel turns his heel ways and becomes good, but then like you know betrays them again later. Yeah. Well, that's in the soap opera aspect of it too. It's yeah, it's very soap opery and it's great. It, it that's why wrestling is entertaining to me is like the the storylines, right? Like I think I can I can probably rattle off a few of the the arcs within wrestling to you guys, but like I don't know about signature moves or you know like how long they wrestled for like but like i was more interested in like the absurdity of of everything and like how cartoonish it was it was like superhero stuff right where it's like these these men exist outside of the realm of humanity (laughs) they're all weird and have crazy names well let me ask you we'll only do this for me and you steve for this episode since we'll say it yeah but uh just real quick who are your like favorite wrestlers sting you like Sting. Sting. Do you know what's funny about Sting? Ric Flair was his arch, like his mortal rival oh, and maybe best that's friend. Why I hated Ric Flair so much. And Ric Sting would like Ric Flair would turn face. They become a tag team, and then Ric Flair would turn on Sting. It was like it's been happening since the 1970s. I also like Rey Mysterio Jr. Okay, a that's a good answer. I like that he was little and he would do crazy like 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 our acrobatic stuff. Yeah, yeah that's a anywhere really cool answer. mask, which was also pretty dope. Him. Well, for me, wrestling, like, uh, the heyday for me was the era of, like, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior. For me, as far as at this point in my life, uh, the person that I appreciate the most from all that would be Macho Man Randy Savage. Okay. Um, I mean, like a lot of them, a bit of a checkered flag history uh, going on. A uh, complicated individual, but as far as a lot of stuff that he would say publicly, he was actually a lot more uh, even keeled, and it wasn't always about uh, just being throttling other people all the time. He would he would say a lot of motivational things yeah, for people. Yeah, yeah, he would say all sorts of you know bonkers nonsense, yeah. but they all do. But um, uh, just for, for him, I would say it personally. He's the one that's uh, endeared the most to me uh, in the long run. It's a really good uh, answer. Um, for as crazy as Macho Man acted out of that era, he was surprisingly normal. Mm-hmm. And I will I will bring up an interview where he it's not an interview, he's like on a kid's show or something. Mm-hmm. And some some kid was like, Does the macho man cry? And the macho man was like, you know, when the <laughs> macho man's alone sometimes, he likes to cry. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you feel the tears. <laughs> But well, nobody likes a quitter. Your <laughs> Take your count of eight and get back up. Like the cream of the crop. <laughs> like the cream of the crop. <laughs> um, cool. That's a very good. Those are all very good answers. I wasn't expecting that. I'm. Uh, well, I mean, I also didn't elaborate on Sting. I just like that he would sometimes like elevate down from the roof with like a baseball bat and like <laughs> he didn't talk. I know he had like a weird sort of like gimmicky thing earlier and then he yeah. turned into essentially the crow which was like okay now he's, now he's a spawn exact, character he, he yeah. was like john cena basically he had like 
bright colors. You know, he came out in different face paint, like a cr- mm. just across the top. He had bleach blonde hair, and he would come out to the ring and be like, "Whoa, it's showtime!" And then uh, the NWO kept uh, invading WCW. <laughs> And yeah. so hard that he was like, I'm brooding now. So for like my I, I always just assume that rafters, he, I assume that what happened thing was that he went to go see Zorro with his parents and then they got <laughs> shot outside of a movie. <laughs> and the only thing I he know. remembers is like his mom's his mom's pearl necklace bouncing <laughs> along the cobblestone path. Yeah. That's how yeah. every sting entrance would happen is like pearls would rain down from <laughs> the ceiling. <laughs> Murdering the whole audience. Yeah. <laughs> There's pearls um, in my popcorn. Yeah, oh my god, that's I great! I didn't even these pearls. I would not have expected you to like know that at all. I know you're of the era, but sometimes a lot of like people of that era who like were tangentially aware of wrestling didn't know who like Sting was. They're like Austin oh, and yeah, The Rock, no. and that's it. I, so, I, like again, I've 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 never been sort of like sheepish about the fact that i don't really know a lot about wrestling but i i do know enough that like i like it like i I, i've always kind of liked it since i was a kid but i was never like the kid who would go to the playground after the weekend of wrestling events or whatever and be like oh yeah i watched that let's talk about it i was always like so who did what oh okay yeah cool and and, like you know i would absorb it and i played a lot of the video games because they were fun and uh my friend uh durak like he he was not super into it, but he was into it enough that I would tangentially sort of like learn things from just him. And, and I watched a couple of pay-per-view things with like him and his, his friend mm-hmm. when we were kids. So I have enough information that I can, I can probably speak not as a scholar like you, Jason, but I can still speak to the, uh, the subject. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a good month. Um, I look forward to talking to everybody that's going to be on the show about wrestling to, uh, to, uh, to actual, like pretty big wrestling fans and Jacob and Jake and Sam actually. And then Tim, it sounds like you have that connection to the rock and wrestling era. For I also me, like Booker T. He Booker T is a, fantastic as well. Yeah. <laughs> Can you dig it, sucker? <laughs> um, for me, it's CM Punk is my favorite wrestler of all time. That's a very controversial answer. Uh, I like him because he sort of encompasses the things I love about wrestling, and that's heels and good talkers and technical wrestlers. Um, he's not that now. He's kind of an old guy now, and there's been some stuff about him. You know, like not like bad, like outside of wrestling stuff. He's just kind of a dickhead in real life. Yeah. So he plays a dickhead on screen very well yeah um he's back in wwe right now which he said he would never do uh which people don't like but it's shaping up to be an excellent wrestlemania wrestlemania is this weekend so this is this month couldn't have fallen at a better time (laughs) but uh, i guess it happens at the same time every year uh but that said cm punk is like my modern favorite easter and trans visibility day am i right yeah (laughs) yeesh yeesh Lots of pink. I've never seen so many Christians not realize that Easter falls on a different day every year in my life. <laughs> it's wild. It's the capitalist agenda. Yeah. It's the snowflake agenda. Yeah. I can't stupid? believe Biden would make this the day that is Trans Visibility Day on the on the day that we celebrate chocolate eggs and Jesus. And like, when Jesus uh, came back and shit chocolate everywhere or a bunny or something. <laughs> um, anyway, just to just to kind of expand on that a little bit. Um, I grew up loving Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock because the Attitude Era was like really when what? I walked in. What? 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 Isn't that his thing? <laughs> yeah, it is. He says what? He asks, he says a thing and then says what? And the crowd goes, what? I remember um, seeing like a very <laughs> funny moment where it's like <laughs> a bunch of wrestlers like run up to a, a limousine and then Steve Austin goes, they vandalized their car, or someone says they vandalized their car, and then Steve Austin comes around and he goes, "What?" And then it turns, and then on the car is spray painted "What?" with a question. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> I remember that. That's great. Um, That's the comedy. And then The Rock, who went on to be a a bigger movie star than he ever was a wrestler, mm-hmm. uh, he's actually back right now for a little a little thing. Um, he's wrestling on Saturday night. It's a tag team match, so I don't expect him to put in too much work. But uh, I think that's interesting because he came back with his 1998 heel persona. Hmm. I assume that he can't do too much 
like in terms of no. riskiness because of that's why he doesn't come back all the time yeah because yeah, of insurance he's, and he's stuff. a famous movie star at this point. Like, <laughs> yeah people rely on his limbs and it can be very very risky to do a wrestling match because sometimes uh, as much as there is quote-unquote planning there are some improvised events that come up uh and sometimes things aren't always executed uh perfectly as we see in the movie yeah well to bring it back to the movie um this is around the point where Fritz gets, uh, we skipped over a little bit, but I just want to bring this up. The reason why this happens. Okay. The reason why Kevin doesn't win the title is because Harley race has to call an audible because Kevin Von Eric takes too long to get back into the ring. So they just, he changes the finish and he keeps the title. That mm-hmm. kind of, that kind of thing still happens to this day where if you get an injury, if your shoulder comes out, right because that happens people just have bad yeah. parts if you if your knee explodes you're not going to be able to finish the match a lot of people try a lot of people do finish the matches that's the crazy we, part we, we yeah. also we we kind of skipped over a large chunk that i think is important as well. i know but i just wanted to bring it to what we're talking about here and to what tim is saying like if the rock fucking falls on his head and gets a concussion on saturday night that might <laughs> What does that mean for the Hobbs and Shaw too? That it will never is inevitably in production. Mm-hmm. It means that's. It means it's gonna. Nothing will change. It means all those <laughs> yeah. documents that the Rock signed saying you can use AI representation now go into effect. They go into effect. <laughs> okay. Anyway, our you know. Scorpion King. Um, <laughs> the part we skipped over was uh, was Kevin meeting Pam, which yeah, we, mm-hmm. and which I think is a very important yes. part. Um, yeah. First thing that I'll say about this sequence is I think that Don't Fear the Reaper should be retired from all filmmaking or put in out. every movie. No, it needs to ever. get the fuck out of here. It's in too many movies, and I, I get it. It's the seventies. <laughs> I get, I get kind of like touchy with musical choices in movies that are period pieces sometimes when I'm like. Okay, maybe choose something a little bit more obscure. Look, it's what? 1960s, and I'm in a helicopter, and I'm going to the Vietnam War, and if I don't hear all along the watchtower, mm-hmm. what's the, why are we doing this? If I don't yeah. hear the rolling Creedence Clear Old Revival, yeah. This year, yeah. Some folks are born. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking about that with, um, you know, the specifically the use of Don't Fear the Reaper, where, like, uh, yeah, like, it's it, it was a little entry level. It wasn't too thoughtful and, it, and you can probably get very, something a little more it feels appropriate basic. yeah yeah and i mean i get don't fear the reaper you know it's a very surface level song about like not being afraid of your future and not being afraid to take chances and blah blah and like it is appropriate for what's going to happen in the sequence following it yeah but yeah. there are probably one million songs of the era that you could choose that would be a little bit more it wouldn't make you it wouldn't it wouldn't make you think of other movies that's the the main issue is when you when you put yeah. something in that is so well known or snl skits for that much <laughs> just yeah like, oh, <laughs> and, like, and, and that's a good point anything and i say this about video games too anything that takes me out of that frame of mind that then i remember oh yeah i'm just some guy watching a movie right now and i'm not thinking about the movie anymore it's same uh, with video games are- having with Oppenheimer when I was talking about those extended, like sort of almost like music video sequences is you, you forget, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be engrossed in this movie and I'm supposed to be forgetting that I am a human, but then you're, Mm -hmm. you're right back in your seat being like, Oh, Oppenheimer is seeing crazy shit again when he's trying to sleep. Oh, Steve's butt is numb and he maybe (laughs) needs to pee now. (laughs) I shouldn't be thinking that during the movie. (laughs) Um, Does your butt talk to you, Steve? (laughs) (laughs) Um, But uh, uh, but yeah, they they, they get into uh, the match and um, and and that and then afterwards when he's when she's like making an approach to him Hmm. and and you get to kind of see that innocence in Kevin that like. And, and, and it starts to uh, explain that, like, oh, he's just been taking care of not just the families, really, but specifically his brothers. That he's this has been his focus, yeah. and he's been taking care of them through wrestling, where his dad has been traumatizing them through wrestling. He's been taking care of them through wrestling. Yeah, to the point that to the point that first she asks, 
she's like trying to hit on him but that didn't happen in the 70s girls yeah. hit on guys in the 70s and he's like Duh, i don't know <laughs> and she's like how did your parents Jason, ever teach you were you alive in the 70s you don't know what the fuck happened back i'm then. sure that it was very misogynistic uh era yeah but, but i'm anyway. sure that people like this little sweethearts who didn't know how to talk know, to get- girls probably existed as well i'm getting mm-hmm. i'm getting to that she's like didn't your mom ever tell you didn't your family ever tell you how to ask questions and he's like well i guess not and then when they're at dinner, when they're at, on their date a minute later, he literally says to what Tim was saying, like, oh, I want my, you know, we get married, you can have your practice, you, you know, you, uh, all our families can come live in our farm my with us. And she's like, all live on the ranch together. Maybe it, not that. That's it is like a very, yeah, it is like a very blue sky little boy yeah. mentality, right? Like, yeah, oh, it's, it's a step away from living in our tree family. fort. Yeah. yeah, it is. <laughs> Not you know, that far I, either, though. It's like, well, I was a picturing us all living in a tree floor, but you know, like we can live on, on the grass. I <laughs> no girls allowed, but you can come in, wife. You can come in because you're my wife. You're not a girl anymore. You're a woman. one wife per family. Um, yeah. I think at the end of the scene, I mean, it is a very cute and nice sequence, and, and it does contain that, um, the, the analogy of like, you know, promotions and all that stuff that we were talking about earlier, which so I, I do think overall it's a really strong scene, but then at the end, he, he tells the story about how his his older brother died of something. I can't. Remember. I don't think they say. They, they don't. I, I don't know what it's in the movie. In reality, it's uh, some. It's like a electrical shock and drowning uh, that happened by accident in Niagara Falls, I believe. Wow. Okay. I, th- I was like about to say he old. probably drowned or something because that's so traumatizing to anybody to see yeah. someone drown. Um, but then she goes across the sa- the table and gives him a hug, and he gives her a hug, and all I could think was. I don't think I'd want somebody to hug me while they're eating ribs with their bare hands. <laughs> He's leaving like barbecue sauce handprints on her back. They have barbecue hands yeah. prints on each other's yeah. backs. <laughs> yeah, after they kiss, they kiss and they go back and they both have barbecue sauce over their face. There's like a string of barbecue <laughs> sauce connected between them. Um, but but at the same time, like he also doesn't know how to process her coming to hug him. It's that this kind of physical affection, especially in public, is something he's not accustomed to. But he kind of goes in for the kiss, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to rag on Zac Efron in this movie because, you know, like, he obviously went through some sort of accident, but, like, his his face is, like, so much here. It's very different. <laughs> I, I think I think in combination with his bowl cut, uh, his, his Prince Adam bowl cut. Because I saw him in that new sticky badicky or whatever the fuck that movie is I, yeah i couldn't tell you the name of that movie ricky, uh, ricky stanicky yeah yeah um and he he doesn't like i think the haircut is is doing a lot of the framing of the of his jaw here and just yeah. like makes it makes it look yeah. like she's kick, kissing like a bag of beef jerky or something <laughs> um, yeah it, it's it's uh and it, it, it to the point where like we were wondering uh, you know, did he get you know surgery or did he, well, he get had, aesthetic he put had, on? He had several surgeries because he had an accident or something, right? Which yeah, is why some I don't kind of like, rag on it because it's like, oh man, he had a, a serious. Yeah. It's like when uh, Mark Hamill, you know, like yeah. between movies had an accident and he didn't look the same, and everyone was like, "What happened to Mark's face?" And people yeah. were just like, that, "Maybe actually. just." Did chill. he didn't do a car crash or something, and then he came back with that weird chin. Yeah, in uh, between Star Wars and uh, Empire Strikes and Back, he had a he had no a Zac Efron particular accident. Oh no, he like f- slipped and like cracked his face on like a fountain or something in his house. Yeah, in, in uh, his house. Yeah. Oh, I cracked! I fell in my fountain. <laughs> I was thinking, my face like, on you the fell fountain in my home. From I tripped over my pile of money and hit <laughs> my head of my solid gold fountain. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's, it sounded like a, a, a bad injury. And it was also a matter of in the healing process, there's like actual physical therapy um, that he had to do for his jaw muscles. And it led to kind of overgrowing the jaw muscles as well. So that's yeah. why it's, it's like noticeably, it's not the sharp jaw that he had in his high school musical days. And you know, it happens once you're used to it, it's not like jarring or anything. You're just like, oh, yeah, that's just what he looks like. Yeah. Like, you know, so many celebrities have these things that like think about um, what's his name? The guy from what's his name? Mickey Rorick. I was about to say, oh. the guy, I was about to say the guy from Iron Man 2. <laughs> yeah, he's in a lot of other things. He's, yeah. he's, he's in the movie next week. this month. Yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, yeah. Uh, 
he looks like He-Man. He puts barbecue handprints all over his future wife. <laughs> and... <laughs> um, yeah, then he goes home he and he talks to. This is where his father reveals to him that he's going to get the big fight against right? uh, Mance Rayner or whatever. Like I never name. ascended, but you Harley, will. Harley Race yeah. is or whatever his name is. Harley Race, yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I really want to show you guys like a side by side of Harley Race because it's crazy. Well, I mean, to be fair, the guy who plays Harley Race just looks like every sort of like guy that you would work with in a warehouse at some point like it's true like <laughs> rick flair had a very particular look like his nose was kind of like hawkish and his chin was yeah. pointed and like like i would say that if you were to take rick flair and, and and shrink him down and make him very gaunt he would look like a classic witch from like yeah a, like a very very, very sharp features yeah, okay. on him in re real life look at look at this which who is the real harley race in this image I mean, <laughs> I know which one is the real one based on the fact that one is a, a snapshot from the movie we just watched. But but, but but chat, which one's the real one? Which one's the real one? <laughs> Isn't that crazy though? I for how bad like the look of Ric Flair was, I'll talk about what I like. I don't know, week. man. You just showed me a picture of two very different people, and like I I don't think that it's that much of a difference. You don't think that's a very good. It's no, I think they good. look like very different. They have very similar noses, and that's. I think the nose is the good. worst part, personally. Harley Race on the right. I think the eyes happen. are the worst part, and the hair. <laughs> well, I mean, okay, well. well anyway, what do you want? A, a duplicate? Jason is all for AI absorption and just recreating everybody digitally. I think you want to have like a like a a de-aged Han Solo, a de-aged. Uh, <laughs> they're just in your fucking iron claw movie like yeah. i thought it was a good i thought it was a really good <laughs> representation of harley race his this mannerism harley race was an amazing wrestler he mm -hmm. he he was he hearkened in this era of like this the mid 70s there were a lot of these guys that looked like the von erics who were like a bit smaller they were a bit more like fast you know yeah. there's that scene where he's running the ropes <clears throat> it's called running the ropes when you run back and forth Sorry. Yeah, Steve's like, no, um, you're not telling me that. I know that already. But uh, wrestlers were getting faster during this era. And Harley Race was like, I'm going to punch you in the face and beat you with my face punch. Yeah. I, I One of the things I do like about this sort of like co compilation is, again, like we've got that the music that's, you know, it starts at like a slow rumble and it, it, it starts with those low brass instruments and becomes more and more triumphant but at the same time ominous and you're like this is completely pulling from like where wrestling came from which was greek mythology roman uh uh olympians and mm -hmm. the way that classic cinema represented those things through music and they're taking that element from early cinema and using it here and it's so fucking good like it makes you just like get yeah. amped up for the terror, the the curse is coming. Um, but the other thing that I really like is that we've got Zach Efron, who is chiseled and again looks like he's been carved out of soapstone or whatever with, by a, an artist. And then you've got Harley Race, he looks like a fucking bag of milk. And you're like, oh, look at this. <laughs> an extremely strong <laughs> bag of milk. Let's be real. I'm not saying he's not strong. I'm just saying that like the difference between the two is is wild. Like it's, it's crazy. I fought a few bags of milk in my time, and I got to say, um, no. Uh, but th that whole body type thing, though, has been like a thing for wrestling for quite a while, where they have, you know, people that look like they're a featherweight, or and they become uh, uh, wiry and un unpredictable in the ring, and and then people who are just big bruisers, and like you know, you've got. Um, what was his name? Uh, Kong. Uh, King Kong was, Bundy. King Kong Bundy and Andre the Giant, oh, who has a little know. appearance in this movie, interestingly enough. I'm narrating a YouTube channel about wrestling, and I had to do a huge thing on King Kong Bundy, actually. There you go. Recently. Yeah. So, and, 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 and especially if you had, depending on how you want to personify the, the heroes and the heels, uh, where, yeah, with Ric Flair, it, it's not just that. Uh, it, it, that he's got the attitude, but like the look of him is kind of almost aristocratic in a weird way, especially with the platinum blonde hair. Oh. Do you know what's weird? I can't find, I think people's problem is that all the pictures that they're comparing him to are Ric Flair at the earliest 
from the 90. From I the think 90s. That the consensus between me and Tim <clears throat> is that we don't care if somebody looks like how they're supposed to look. True. We just, as long as we care about the performance and what the movie, mm-hmm. if, it, if it if it is servicing the movie, who gives a fuck if they look? Yeah. The consensus for me is that I wish that Ric Flair looked a little bit more like Ric Flair. But that said, but does that ruin the movie for you when he's doing a good no. job? As like when he's when he is he not I'll, hyping you up when he's or are I'll you talk just about on his nose not being right? Or, no, we'll I'll get talk to about Ric Flair when we get to it. I'm just trying to find a picture right now of Ric Flair. I'm ready to fight in the ring this about this later. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you something mean, Jane. I got lizard skin eyelashes. I got lizard skin fingernails. Why are you like mostly lizard skin, man? I got lizard skin, lizard skin. <laughs> He's a secret member of Cobra. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the, the wrestling scenes in general in this movie, um, they're all really good. And, and all the angles uh, are often from like ringside audience level, which is a great way for it in a movie sense to kind of put you into that era that like you, you're almost like feeling the filth of the floor kind of thing. Yeah. That's, what I, that's something I really enjoyed. Smell about the film. sweat. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever been to like a, a wrestling match before Tim, but mm. it is pretty exciting. Like even if you don't like wrestling, if yeah. you're there and you're you're in it and people are getting tossed out near you and you're you're hearing skin hit floor and stuff like it is quite exciting you get, you get kind of wrapped up in the moment for sure you do. And to you do super forget kids. april not, 26th my you birthday don't, you don't forget that it's that it's you know staged and that it's you know written and but you do get more invested in it because you're there and you're watching it and you're like i like this the cut of this guy's jib i don't know his <laughs> story i don't know his mother's name and i don't give a shit about what he's <laughs> this, but i want him to win <laughs> like i i i get it and and th- this movie captures that feeling as well being low mm-hmm. like there, there's not a lot of of high angles in this and the high mm-hmm. angles you get are usually from like the seats way in the back, you know, like the, the bad seats or whatever. Yeah. Or, or it's when they're coming in and for, you're, for you're meant to be like in general. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're, yeah. they're being showered in um, cheers. And it, it's, I think the, the purpose of that is because you're supposed to be cheering, right? Like it's supposed to feel like the cheers are coming from you being showered down onto them. Right. Like when Ric Flair first enter, enters the arena, even though he's, a villain and like the boos are coming it's like you're supposed to be like i'm booing too <laughs> from yeah. up here in the in the nosebleed section yeah um i think that every time the camera is in the ring from when they're in these packed seat events to when they're in the small gym events to when they're in the, the intimate personal uh training sessions like it's all accomplished like everything they do is perfect like mm-hmm. i can't imagine how they would film it better than how they did in in every sequence the the part where uh carrie is is trying to retrain himself again after losing his foot is like pretty heart-wrenching and it's all one long shot just slowly pushing in on it it's mm-hmm. so good man this movie's good <laughs> i gotta say this movie is good anyway uh let's move on through the story mm-hmm. again i keep getting us off rails so here. <clears throat> yeah during this we talked about how uh he takes the bump uh Harley Race kind of calls an audible and gets a de- gets DQ'd himself. A DQ in professional wrestling always means the champion does not lose their title, unless storyline is like you, you always get yourself DQ'd. And this Sunday, if you get yourself DQ'd, I've got it sanctioned. Then I win the belt. That happens from time to time. Mm-hmm. Um, also, did you like my promo there? I thought that was a pretty good promo. <laughs> uh, but the thing that I noticed here is harkening back to earlier in the movie where Kevin Von Eric can't cut a promo to save his life. Uh, Michael, is that his name? No. Uh, David. David Von Eric gets yeah. in the ring and cuts a fucking epic promo saying like, you know, you can't do this to us. You know, you like I like we we got a vendetta to settle. <clears throat> and you can see on Kevin's face that he's like, oh, man. I just lost this. Match. I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah. And I can't get my words together. And now this guy. It is. It reminds me of like, obviously it's not the same thing, but like when you're playing like D and D or like in any kind of improv moment, right. Where you're supposed to be able to uh, compose yourself and come up with something on the spot. That's compelling and interesting. And 
either scary or you know harrowing or whatever it is and you you can't quite formulate the words and someone else steps in sometimes it can be the best feeling ever as the person who, who can't find the words and sometimes it's like if only i had a couple more seconds i could have i could have figured out what to say yeah um i mean it's like that in real life yeah it, like if you're at a business meeting or any any time yeah like or on this yeah. podcast sometimes i'll i'll start talking without knowing where i'm going and then i get i hit a wall and no, then you about. should let the people who know what they're about to say say steve so. just starts talking and i'm like i'm just i'm not gonna yeah <laughs> but uh you know fritz comes in he, he gives kevin the gears for for fucking up the spot that's what that's what it's called in wrestling um, I know what ha- I know what they were trying to convey there. When he got suplex on the cement, he got I think what's known as a stinger, and that's where basically you land on your spine in a way that makes like your half your body go numb. Like he couldn't yeah. like he couldn't move. It wasn't that he just had the air knocked out of him, like I a state of shock. Yeah, yeah. I think he I think his like I think his half of his body went numb <laughs> for a minute, yeah. and this is where it transitions over to the brother that they had talked about. A little bit, and arguably the biggest star of the whole family. Um, even though his 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 run was very short, uh, Carrie Von Erich, who is, was an Olympian, he was a shot put thrower. He was destined for the Olympics. Unfortunately, though, he was uh, elected prom queen of his prom. <laughs> and he got a bunch of blood dumped on him. <laughs> Did that happen? Uh, wrong movie? Different. Wrong character. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> That'd be like one of those movie mashups where you like take two movies and make them make it awful and call it Carrie Von Eric. Yeah. But I think Don't Fear the Reaper was in that movie too. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, she was the Reaper. <laughs> yeah, you, that um, really... It is absolutely wild to me that the Olympics got canceled because of the cold. No, well, the Olympics didn't right? get canceled. Uh, sorry, the US... not, not the entire Olympics. But the Americans pulled out yeah. of the Olympics. No, they, they pulled out of the Olympics because Ric Flair was too sexy. And this is the image they had. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Damn, look, at all that, look at all that lizard skin. <laughs> He's mostly lizard skin. Fun fact about Ric Flair is he survived a plane crash. And he used to be big fat guy. He kind of looked like this. And uh, when he came back, he looked like the Ric Flair we all know now. Mm. Slightly less big. Fun fact. Was that fun? I had fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but yes, as he was saying, the U.S. is like, we will not go to Russia. Jimmy Carter is like, we will not go to Russia. Yeah, and for the Moscow Olympics, out. yeah. And the, unfortunately it's... for the Von Erich family, that's kind of all they had. And uh, Fritz has a little meltdown. That seems like it could be part of a curse but that's just like the american curse which yes. is that america has way too much pride in itself like why why would you not send your olympians who've been training for years i understand and i wasn't around at the time to feel the sort of like geopolitical echo that it would have on the american people and what most people would think about it mm. but the olympics is sort of like a a thing that exists on a global scale that to pull out for something like that. I don't understand it. Maybe it was for security reasons. Maybe it was to be like, we're, we're America the strong. I don't know. It was like well, right the, before uh, the cold war. It, there was a lot of tension. That, no, I, I, I get that, but I'm like the iron. Well, it, it, it was, it was in direct opposition to the idea that they were occupied uh, the Russian. Well, the Soviet union was occupying Afghanistan at the time. Right. And uh, and so there there was because of uh, those elements and the uh, stalemate involved with it that it, it didn't you know according to the Carter administration it wasn't in good spirit to participate in the Olympics which is supposed to be a peaceful event being hosted in Moscow when they were occupying a country. Um, so it, I mean it's it's complicated. And the Olympics have always been a complicated thing, even when like Berlin before World War II hosted the Olympics and there were countries that were uh, boycotting that at the time as well. Yeah. So I guess uh, it's like an echo of that sort of like, we have to make a stand here. Yeah. It's, it's hard to separate the politics from the Olympics uh, in that sense, but, uh, but yeah, what, but, what, 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 what's everyone's opinion here? Should they, or should they? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, I, I have no horse in the race of the Olympics, but uh, um, 
Except for well, that I mean, horse it's like an opposite, like the opposite of right now. Where <laughs> Except for Tim the horse. Yeah. The U.S. is like, yeah, pro-Israel when Israel is genociding on a public stage. It's like the opposite where they're like, yes. Well, let's not, let's not get into real world. Chill out a bit, now. but yeah. I, I'm it, more though. comfortable talking about politics that happened in the 1970s. That's 80s. fair. Yeah. That's but, fair. Uh, I'm now but, canceled. But, That's my weekly cancellation, ladies and gents. That canceled for saying, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but, okay, for, for, <laughs> but for for Fritz, though, uh, he um, he takes it as a personal slight, yeah. as he does everything. As, I as I the, took that personally. <laughs> yeah, and like for Carrie, yeah, like like he's looking for some structure in his life. And unfortunately, it's this dysfunctional uh, operation on the go that's his only other recourse um, in the in the movie. So, and he has nowhere nowhere else to go but back to the farm. And you know what that means? If you go back to Fritz's house, you become a professional wrestler and you try to win the grandest in title. This house, we yeah. only wrestle all the and time. win the biggest yeah. titles. We I'm don't surprised you didn't make them wrestle for like bacon and stuff. In a <laughs> <laughs> That's too low a station for a world champion wrestler. Yeah. <laughs> and they wear the bacon as a belt when they're done. Um, <laughs> last piece of bacon. You know the rules, honey. The last peg piece of bacon has to pin me to the ground. Oh, you mean in their own home? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I thought you meant like at the market. <laughs> no, like, <yeah>. You got to <laughs> use that bacon grease on yourself before we wrestle. But yeah. uh, <clears throat> but it, it <laughs> but after Carrie comes home, they have their football match. And of course the dad is barking at them the whole time about what they should and shouldn't be doing for football. That really brought me back to some childhood stuff where like, there are some people I know that this reminds me of. Are you talking about childhood trauma? Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully not for me personally. My, my parents weren't uh, too invested into uh, sports. So, yeah. but I, I saw plenty of kids go through the ringer from their parents for, for stuff like that. And I just try to get me into every single sport known to mankind. Uh, never try to get me into like piano or anything or like <laughs> art. Anyway, I, I did do karate and my dad tried to find a way for me to do it for free. <laughs> so, anyway, that was, yeah. that was the most, the, the conversation over boards and was like, chop these in half. Tim. <laughs> oh, I found yeah. an actual image of Tim learning Kung Fu for free. <laughs> <laughs> for, yeah. That's, that's it. Exactly. That was before the beard kicked in yeah. um, before my plane crash. But <laughs> uh, uh, I would, I, before we move on from it, the, the, uh, the football stuff, it also, again, kind of plays into him always having this sort of narrative or like ability to, to string together a speech at any moment where mm -hmm. he's, he's like, like commentating coach. the football game while they're playing. And then being like, you know, like the Nebraska bull boys called me up last week and they said, why the hell do they have it? And he's like saying all this, you know, sort of inspirational baloney that means absolutely nothing, mm -hmm. which to me made me realize like, Oh, this is how he is all the time no matter what's happening he's always going to be like you know i once met an old woman in an alley and she told me this tale and it was all about the von buren boys and how they'd be like he could just like string together anything at any point for yeah. whatever reason in order to manipulate people around him mm -hmm. uh and it, it just keeps going and going and going and i remember when we saw it in theater i was like this guy's like kind of an abrasive prick but I get it. Like he's also trying to be fatherly. But then I, at that moment, I was like, "Oh, he's also like overbearing in the in the way that you would be like, shut the fuck up, Dad. Like, how many beers have you had today? You yeah, clawed old fuck. The iron, and, and, the iron claw uh, needs some grease. <laughs> <laughs> well, like when Carrie first walks in and he has his quick embraces with his mother and father, and it's when the brothers are all together again. You feel and. The, and then, and that's when he's home, and that's when he's with his family finally. Like he, 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 these two immediate people that gave him life, like they're kind of incidental in a weird way, uh, yeah. as far as his his sense of home and family is concerned. And like we're about to get into the like the Mara Tierney stuff as well, where like she's already had some pretty good moments in the movie, good in terms of performance. I think that she's probably maybe the best in this movie. I was going to say, I hope that she wins something out mm -hmm. of this because yeah. I, her performance in this was like devastating. It was very realistic. Yeah. And she's been a good actor for a long time. I don't know if I've seen her really get her flowers. 
I don't I don't know either. Yeah, but like I, I mean, in this movie, she she's one of the. It's like a, a classic character actor thing where she like she vanishes into the per- performance where you like you leave thinking about a bunch of the other performances, but you don't think about that one, and then you rewatch it and you're like, oh, I forgot that you're maybe the best part of this movie. Like you you glue everything together in a way that will go unnoticed without, you know, having people watch it with that sort of appreciative eye. It's almost, yeah. That's how good, I get what you're saying. That's a really interesting way to look at it. Like when characters are so good that like, they're almost like <laughs> this sounds bad, but like a set piece. And I don't mean that in like a derogatory way. I mean that in like a, you, you're not worried about their performance because it's so good where yeah. Fritz von air comes in and you're like, Oh God, what the, Fuck you're like oh it's a cartoon man yeah cartoon. <laughs> yeah but but in that way though she is a person who has been uh made subservient to all this we're like when you meet her at the beginning of the movie she's you know saying her protests about buying the new car and, and what are we gonna do and then it, it, her scene in that kind of ends with her like i'm just gonna keep my thoughts to myself yeah and you, and you get kind of the impression that like it's it's a downward slope for her from there as far as her uh the value of her opinion as far as the direction of rearing this family goes it is weird because you also you get a couple of moments before this where you know uh earlier in the movie kevin zach efron goes to her to be like dad's being too hard on brother number four or whatever uh (laughs) mike mike yeah you need to say something and she's like no like, I'm not going to say anything. He's not going to listen to me if I do. She doesn't yeah. say it in all these ways. is like, you know, sort of the intent of the scene. But it's like, you get the idea that he will listen to her on certain things. But other mm-hmm. things, she understands that, like, he has made his mind up. And there's absolutely no way that we can change the way he's going to act on yeah. these things. So, like, in the sequence that we get at this point in the movie, where they're having dinner at a picnic table outside, everything is picturesque beautiful it's like sunset it's you know the the food looks amazing everybody's having a really nice time yeah uh, and then the conversations shifts to a little bit about their past which you don't get a lot of in this movie at all mm-hmm. and you learn that uh fritz is like an accomplished mu- musician like classically trained musician yeah. yeah he knows how to play and, and a clarinet of all of all instruments which is like yeah, you, you, should, you should be like a tambourine or a drum for him, yeah, but yeah. Drummer, yeah. For a tuba <laughs> player. Yeah. Did we say tuba at the same time just then? Yeah, like, <laughs> like, you look like a strong man. You could hold a tuba. You could hold a full tuba. <laughs> but, uh, but he plays it, a clarinet, which is like typically a very dexterous and light and beautiful instrument. Mm-hmm. And you, it's almost impossible to imagine this fucking blockhead playing a, a yeah this this clarinet. thick thick neck wow. maniac yeah. playing a clarinet yeah. uh, at but and, and then he he dismisses it as if he's embarrassed by it because he would never make any money out of it he would never make any kind of um uh, how he views success out of it yeah well he, and, what he says is like i realize there's no uh there's no future in music and i was yeah. right and you're like, oh god! And then Michael's <laughs> like, well, you know, I I have a gig tonight. Maybe I could go to my gig. And they're like, the parents are like, absolutely not. Well, it's they like, they're interested at first until he says it's on a. He also says that he's in a quartet from school, which I love so fucking much that he's calling oh, his great his euphemism band, his garage way. band a quartet. That's so yeah. fucking funny. Um, <laughs> and then she's like, oh oh no, not happening. Sorry. And then th- that's when you realize that like dad is not all encompassing power. He realizes like he might've said, yeah, but he hears mom saying no. And he's like, no, your mom said no. And that's, that's the end of that. Mm -hmm. And then he starts fucking typewritering his piece of corn. Like, (laughs) 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 yeah, but more eating and more eating in the movie. In the true fashion of every movie where there's a conversation like that cut immediately to them sneaking out uh, the thing that I love about them pushing the car out of the driveway and then starting it like down the road. Um, mm-hmm. My dad tells stories about doing that to sneak out. Uh, well, your dad's one of the Van Buren boys. My right dad's now. one of the Van Buren boys. Uh, <laughs> Van Buren. I, in, realistically, the in movies, they don't Von Eric's. have that attention to detail. Like, And that's such, such a uniquely 1970s experience, I would imagine. My dad also tells a story about going to do that. And as he was climbing out his window... 
he like had to step down onto his parents like windowsill Mm -hmm. and sneaking out one night he stepped down onto his dad's head (laughs) (laughs) and his dad just like took his foot and like just put kind of pushed him back up (laughs) (laughs) and we will never speak of this again and we will never speak of this again that's funny i i do like that moment as well because it like you know it just gives a little bit of character to everything right it's one of those like you you don't have to put that in there but it it sprinkles in just a bit of like oh sneaky behavior this isn't the first time they've done this because they right. probably tried to sneak out before started the car in the driveway yeah they got caught and yeah and it's the four brothers uh taking care of each other and watching out for each other. we're we're and we're going to uh we're going to in, indulge your interests we're we're going to see your music show and the song that he plays, um, I don't know if it's like, I, I couldn't recognize it as a real pop song from, from the real world, but they're, like, they're singing about how they kind of want this to be this way forever. Yeah. And, and, and it's just Great for kind of, yeah, because like the rest of the movie is going to get a little rough. This is the, kind of the turning point because... Spoiler alert. It spoiler isn't. alert. It's basically Hamlet. Um, <laughs> what I like about this sequence, though, is it's showing... This happens later in the movie too when they're on the road, but it's uh, Kevin sitting in a chair and just watching his brothers do all kinds of crazy shit. And this time it's pretty mundane. He's watching his brother play on the stage. He sees Carrie do a keg stand push ups, and he's like, that seems like it's troublesome or could be. And uh, it's, it's very heartwarming. Uh, the next time that Kev, uh, Kevin's in the corner watching. There's like he sees like his brother doing cocaine and getting into a fight, and one of his brothers is dead. You know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. They all. He also says like, "So, what do you think about us? Uh, we're a lot, right?" Like he says to his future wife, and she's like, "I love your family so much." And all I could think was, "No, yeah, he's right. They're they're a lot. If I saw a man do a keg stand and then immediately rip his shirt off, I'd be like, ah! no, thank you. <laughs> I'm not going to interact with these guys at this party, not at all. Yeah, like, might might be push-ups were insane to me. Yeah, and that might be like uh, run of the mill for uh, old Teja for Texas, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I remember looking at it like this. This feels like a lot. That you know, who's going to clean up that spill? <laughs> Also, in real life, I guess Jeremy Allen White like had real alcohol problems and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like he was well, I mean, so like good I've, at playing I've, lip. I've been to university parties that have this yeah. element to it, where you know there is like a weird jockish person who will do a keg stand, and I've done a keg stand before, I but well. I didn't. I didn't do pu- uh, push-ups on it, and I definitely didn't rip my shirt off. You weren't jacked all the way to the future and back. Yeah, on the Roy. Jack to the future is what they. Jack to the future. <laughs> <laughs> they called me Jack to the Future Part Two. <laughs> He's so uh, ripped, he went back in time. Dun, 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 dun. Um, yeah, and then uh, you know, old uh, old Kevin Von Erich loses his little virginity to his little girly friend, and she's like, "What? You've never done this before?" And he's like, "I don't really know anything." He's like, "Well, I mean, I've never done anything before." Really. <laughs> well, lost his little virgin. I have a little virginity left to lose. And she's like, she like gets on him, and he's like. Grr! immediately like, I've, I've been, yeah, he's like i've been wrestling since i was 12 i i lost a little bit of my virginity at some point yeah i took a body slam right to the butthole once <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it had never happened before they call it a butthole slam it's it's in the books now i think i should probably call the police yeah <laughs> Anyway, so because because I mean, don't it's fear a good the scene. it's a good little scene. Like you know, I like that it's in silhouette. It's really yeah. well shot. Um, another yeah, it's not gratuitous or something. Yeah. No, like again, like I watched Oppenheimer and there's like this weird sort of like sex stuff that happens in it that it's not bad. And there's like certain moments that I'm like, oh, this is really well done. I haven't seen a sex scene done like this before. But then there's also stuff where I'm like, eh, they just wanted to show boobs here. I think <laughs> they just really needed to show boobs to they get the to guys sure back. You knew that Oppenheimer saw boobs. At some yeah, point. to get the guys back who <laughs> went to that with their girlfriends and the guys who weren't like Christopher Nolan freaks who went with their girlfriends. No, 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 no. no. I don't mean that they needed to show boobs in the movie. Oh, okay, they sorry. needed to show that Oppenheimer the oh. man saw boobs because okay. it seems so <laughs> weird that they have to make a connection with the audience. He saw <laughs> boobs just like you, kind of thing. Okay. I haven't seen Oppenheimer yet. I don't mean I... it was like supposed to be titillating for the audience. I mean it was it supposed to be like way. you connect with Oppenheimer. Yeah. Uh, so the the thing that because they 
already had Don't Fear the Reaper. Naturally, they also have to show it's the 70s by playing Tom Sawyer by Rush. Wait, no, you're skipping over the the looming cloud of Ric Flair. Ding, ding, ding. When his dad is in the office, like, watching the Ric Flair fight, the fight that Eric was supposed to have. And then, you know, Ric Flair wins, and it's like Ric Flair is the winner. And then the that that fucking horn music, the gladiatory music is playing again, like, and he, like, looks over. And, like, the whole time I'm thinking they're hyping up Ric Flair so well in this movie to be this, this like, ultimate villain. But every time they do it, the dad it's, is there. The dad is yeah. there. The dad is the villain. The dad is the villain the whole time. Is that is that the, is that where they show Ric Flair do the amazing promo on screen? No, that's much later. Okay. La- later. This is just a fight. He's he's catching the tail end of the Ric Flair okay. fight on TV in his office at the 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 gym or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, the sportatorium. The sportatorium. That's which what is it was like, actually called. I know, but it's like one of the funniest words I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> like, Very yeah. famous arena. Yeah. <laughs> Come on down to the sportatorium. We got <laughs> wrestling. It sounds like something from Futurama, you know? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've got to get down to the old sportatorium. <laughs> I, I parked my car at the carnasium. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. We're getting on. <laughs> Okay. You know his mind is not for rent. Yeah. 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 But this is a good montage too because it's still it's still fine like it starts with Michael list doing what he loves. He gets the new record. He's got the sound system. But during this, this is when you start to see the cracks forming in Carrie who is they're having bloody hardcore matches in the ring and then he's fighting people and going nuts at bars as well because i think they're supposed to be like on tour here this is also where the stuff with the with the Freebirds is happening very insane time in wrestling one of the first wrestling booms was basically the von erics versus the versus the, like they were on tv all over the all over the states um territory wrestling was sort of bleeding out of the territories at this time because this feud was because rick flair they don't cover Jerry Lawler in this movie, but Jerry Lawler and then these six men were just ripping it up. And they were having these like like the proto hardcore matches that were so popular in the 90s, like the blood and the weapons and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And Carrie Von Eric is has is bleeding for about eight minutes during the sequence, which I liked. I thought was great. Mm-hmm. Great representation. Then they find they win the big six man belts. They win the six man titles. So is this where he gets his internal rupture or whatever his intestinal rupture? It well, that's be. Well, that that's da- uh, David. Um, but that's not until uh, towards the the wedding. He is like right so after. David is chosen after this. They win the six man titles and then and going to Japan. Then, yeah, like, Fritz is like, "You're, I'm choosing you now to be the champion." And yeah. Carrie, uh, Kevin Von Erich is sitting there like, "Wait, how did how did we skip over me?" And Fritz is like, "My new favorites go like this. It goes you and then Kevin, yeah. and then the the leaderboard update. Yeah, uh, yeah. but the, the lead up to that though is actually my favorite." Uh, part of the movie outside of a uh, uh, guy saying bruiser Brody. But my favorite part of the movie is um, after they, they win their three on three match and uh, 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 Mike joins them on stage and he's congratulating them. And then Fritz comes on to do the patter at the end. And he cuts, that's when he cuts the promo in front of everybody about his mm-hmm. favorites. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and announces that uh, uh, David is going to be uh going for the, uh, the world championship title and seeing the reactions of the four brothers and, and the, these divisions building and these problems developing and the insecurities of them, because like, they're not even able to, you know, it, after he kind of announced these, like, any problems? Uh, and no, no, sir. No, no sir. Problem here. <laughs> like, uh... <Yeah. laughs> and, and seeing how like sheepish um, uh, Mike becomes, just like I, you know, I I don't want to go do the wrestling, you know, and 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 like his his shoulders, you can see him like shrinking in, uh, and and looking down and looking away from the audience and not making eye contact with the brothers, and it's the slow shot building in, going closer and closer to them, seeing that tension build. I'm not even too sure if the music's playing, but it wouldn't surprise me if that intense uh, horn section playing again for the dad talking. Uh, it's a great scene, and uh, I, I and. and between uh, them going out to the university party and then to that, like that's where like things can tip over 
into this downfall for the family that like from here it's going to get rough and yeah. and and, th and this is that little tipping point where like the dad is really taking the wheel and, and turn this family van into into the ditch yeah like the o'doyles when they slip on that banana peel and then <laughs> goes over there, like, O'Doyle, O'Doyle. i thought he was doing like a classic like if you don't shut up i'm gonna turn this car around <laughs> he just turns it he does a 360 yeah and floors it and floors mm -hmm. it the hell. uh the next scene is kevin gets married it's a, kind of some sweet stuff going on i thought it was very nice that the the parents fritz has another kind of real moment where he's like you know there's no kids in the house right now and she's like i'm dtf <laughs> 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 and uh but then kevin goes into the bathroom and he hears somebody puking and he's like oh you're having too much fun are you who's in there and then it's it's david fucking with the old this is the modern version of you know in old movies when somebody coughs into a handkerchief and they, they yeah, show blood. it and it's blood and they look around like Ugh. it there's blood everywhere all over the toilet bowl yeah i mean so over the i top. remember thinking it during i might even have said something to who i think i was sitting was i sitting you were sitting next guys? to me yeah yeah no. okay no i i think i was sitting next to tim because maybe i was between both of you guys i think i mm -hmm. was in the middle and because I would whisper things to you guys throughout, just to try and get a <laughs> chuckle here and there. Um, but <laughs> I think I, I, I was like, "You should probably have a doctor check that out." Like, if you have that much blood in your barf, go to a, a, a hospital immediately. Am I wrong? Like, yeah, and and no, or, you know, don't go to Japan, especially where you can't speak uh, Japanese. Uh, to a doctor, to a hospital, go to a hospital. You're absolutely right. He's like, nah, just like uh, I got a little stomach bug. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, something inside you is. No, did you, no it looks like you swallowed a knife. Yeah. You might have swallowed a knife. Did you? Yeah. Did you swallow but, a bag of thumbtacks? But th this is like, but this is something like, I know that there is some truth to that where like the, the at least announced cause of death, I forget the name of it, but it was something to do with those deep ruptured stomach issues. Yeah. What necessarily causes that? I think there was some people throwing on some suspicion in real life that like, was it complicated with substance abuse or who knows what, but the fact that like, he's trying to hide it or trying to downplay it and keep on going is kind of speaking to the, uh, the dysfunction of, of the family. I also think that like, <clears throat> we talked about it earlier where, you know, they omitted an entire brother, right? Yeah. And if, uh, I will if, say about all of this, like these timelines and the realities of all these things, they just, they kind of streamlined it all. Like, I'm pretty sure that um, Carrie may have had a family by this point. Or yes. David may have also had a family by this point. They like, they just kind of like wanted, and this part, this last act of the movie is very much like something happens, something happens, something happens, something happens where the first part of the movie is a lot of like world building giving back background about this the family and then it, it, right after this like right after the tom sawyer part it's like tragedy 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 you know what i mean it's interesting way to tell the story but as we were as you were saying earlier steve to really cover this whole thing you yeah. need to either do a podcast about it or you need to have a 19 part mini series right. about the von eric well, well yeah that's like what i was yeah. gonna say is like you know whether it be substance substance abuse abuse or not i don't think at that point in the story for a movie it doesn't necessarily matter it's, it's he's dead well, but the, the the director actually uh when he was asked about that he said um the reality is so much worse than what is in the movie yeah you can't make a movie like that no. right that, that yeah just and, functionally as you're saying that like yeah like the, the audience would just be like walking out but then that's why you have moments right after this right or not even right after within this same scene uh there's like a surprisingly healthy amount of introspection that kevin has in himself right he, he apologizes for getting upset he realizes that like all he really cares about is the Van Buten boys, <laughs> the, 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 the Von, the Van, Von Eriks. Mm. He, he is trapped by his dad's psychosis, his yeah. dad's overbearing nature. He, they're trapped in the iron claw basically, but yeah. like, he, he has enough self-awareness and introspection to, to look at it and be like, I need to take a step back. It's fine. You be the world champion. 
and I get to focus on my family now. And and I'm going to maybe make it a little bit better for my family than it was for us. Which and is also, like, a, a, like a sprinkle of hope in this yeah. very bleak story. Just real quick, uh, Tim, it, I, what's funny about your new setup mm. is, are your eyes blue in real life? Uh, yeah, more well, or less, yeah. Know, the way that the light is hitting them, it looks like you're on spice right now. You have the, <laughs> you have the doom, spice eyes. I just, I wanted to say it before I forgot, and I wanted to bring a little bit of levity to the horrible darkness we're about to go in mm-hmm. to, starting yeah. with what Steve was just talking about. Before we put our hands into that ganja bar, right. that is the iron claw. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, which is also like the, the dune popcorn bu- bucket. <laughs> we call it the iron claw. Fuck bucket, as they've been calling it on the internet. Boy, oh People boy. want to fuck that thing. Did someone call it a fuck bucket? I, I call it that. Let's go. <laughs> that's a, well, for me, that's any bucket. But no, um... yeah, yeah, fuck a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, Lots too, please. But uh, to to the point of like the, the iron claw, like you actually see in the training um, moment there. I mean, not to backtrack too much, but the dad again teaching or going over the lesson of the iron claw. Like, no, you got to put pressure on him. I got to feel the pressure, and and he does it to uh, to David, where he's like pushing him down the mat, and David's asking him to stop, and like yeah, like like another you know where the wrestling is representing what's thematically going on in the movie, which just speaks to how, how well thought out this is, which is why it's so surprising for a new director to be so well realized in his vision for this. Yeah. I also think a lot about how much damage can you do to somebody by grabbing them with one hand on the top of their head? <laughs> is it a lot? Can it be a lot? Do you need to have fingernails? What's going on? I mean, from a, <laughs> if I'm going to explain it to you in kayfabe, it's that he's been training his hand. What'd you say? Kayfabe? K is. I thought you said cave Mabe. I was like, what is this cave, caveman mentality? Cave no, K, in K Fabe, K Fabe is just the for the, those of you that don't know, K Fabe is like the dropping the uh, like the suspending your disbelief element of wrestling. The, what what's happening in the world of wrestling that isn't the reality? I guess is the best way to put yeah, it. I think so in K Fabe, I would say that Fritz von Erich trained his hand for decades right. and he's, he's able like to apply to the grocery store and he's like just right. he's, like, ah. and he's able to apply a grip Elk to your nuts. temples with these two fingers and to the top of your f- frontal cortex that makes you just your eyes pop out of your head basically mm-hmm. um the reality of the Jason, situation I remember one time me and you fake fought wrestling in front of uh, me fake wrestle friend in, while drunk in, in front of like our boss at the time and he got <laughs> actually very concerned that he had injured me and he he came up to help me and i was like get away from me <laughs> and then i went back it was very funny we did yeah. a good job because that's it. the thing wrestlers are very good at faking that they've been injured that's part of it. it's called selling right you want to sell your injury yeah people are bad at it and some people get hit with like some people take the iron claw for instance and just go nope and pull the hand off and that destroys the credibility of the person applying the, right. the the claw right so then to to explain why um it, a few minutes later in the movie he gets disqualified for using the iron claw because not only is it like a banned technique but he was taught by his father to train that hand by oh, crushing it's watermelon evil. it's like skeletor exactly yeah. i taught he man everything he knows <laughs> <laughs> uh, fake he man i'll get you yeah. for this before we leave the wedding I have to throw in line dancing is racist and we all know it. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just that's dot, dot, dot. I like how Tim went. "Mm -hmm." Mm Yeah. Yes, it is. Let's never do it again. So Mm -hmm. they, yeah. So then they, they don't have a, so David dies. David's like, I'm fine. I'm going to Japan. And then the next scene is like, your brother's dead. He died in Japan of a rupture. So, like intestine. at this point in the movie, when we first saw it, I did not know. Like, I, I, I you know, the the foreshadow him barfing up blood. I'm like, this motherfucker is dead for sure. <laughs> but like, I didn't know if he was doing drugs or like why was he bleeding Same. internally, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, him sitting at the table. I'm like, oh fuck, he's gonna. It's gonna be like he OD'd in his 
his apartment or whatever in Japan. And I was partially correct, which is they're like intestinal rupture. And I'm like, and then I think, uh, doesn't Zach Efron go like, what does that mean? And then it's <laughs> like, it like cuts to the next scene of them all at a funeral. I'm like, they didn't, they didn't tell us what it means. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't need to know what it means, but like at the same time, I want to, like you were saying, Tim, where they're like, it's implied maybe that it could have been drug. Like I wanted to know, but yeah. um, I hadn't seen the full movie at this point. And on second watch, I was like, yeah, they were smart to not start to like have a, you know, seven minute long sequence for where him and his dad talk at the, the dining room table about like, turns out he was on all sorts of fucking drugs and you know, yeah. the, cur the curse is real. Never do drugs or whatever. Uh, so it works because it then goes into this. It's almost a montage because it's very short uh, little individual moments. It's not like a musical montage where you're, you know, piecing together what's happening through music and it's, you know, like five second snips, but it's like a minute, a minute, a minute, a minute of each character. And uh, it's pretty potent and powerful. And, and we, you know, like we said earlier, dad always has some fucking douchey speech up his butt that he can pull out at any moment. Yeah. And at this point, he walks out with a fucking cowboy hat. I'm like, when does he work? He hasn't worn a cowboy or a cowboy. Movie. He's all of a sudden got a cowboy, his funeral cowboy hat. Well, he actually had a church cowboy hat at, towards the beginning of the movie. Yeah, oh, right. And it was it wasn't black though, right? It was like a no, no. Hat. That that was his happy hat, not his yeah. sad hat. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but uh, uh, you make everybody take their sunglasses off because you're not allowed to hide behind your sunglasses. Right. There's no no hiding and no crying. And no this crying. was the this was the then point. he immediately hold on he he immediately goes into a speech a, a, another. Fritz speech and even the movie at this point is like shut the fuck up Fritz yeah. and it like cuts to the mom and you can hear the echoing of him like on the porch giving the speech and the movie is even like this guy's too much like we can't even sit here and listen to this guy anymore we've got to go to somebody else and, and see what they're feeling and during uh, this sequence too is a, when I that's when I had that moment of more tyranny being like she's destroying this role because right before they go to the funeral she's up in her room and uh pam comes in and she's like we gotta go and she's like struggling to put on her dress and she's crying and she's like they're i can't wear this dress again they're gonna know it's the same dress and well, i know that's, that's like that's whatever ca that's, carries uh death i think funeral, yeah yeah that's not oh, is that funeral. okay yeah. sorry my bad this my is bad. her yeah. just getting ready and she's not breaking down she's just getting ready and it's a little bit concerning, but you're like, oh, she's trying to be reserved and she's hearing the speech that uh, Fritz is giving about no tears and everything. And I think she's also listening to it. But, you know, like I said, the movie has decided that we've had too much of this guy giving us speeches every time something bad happens. We've got to cut to what she feels and we're, we're hearing him give the speech and it's, you know, she's absorbing it a little bit. But the second time, we don't get that right. Like the second time that she's dealing with another one of her children's death, which is her third child dying at that she's point, yeah. she's completely removed and it's all about her. And it, and it is like about her emotions. This first one though, is like, it's, it, it feels like she's, she's trying to do what's best for him again, but we're finally getting away from him. Mm hmm. Oh, he's so such a prick, man. He's such a fucking prick. So anyway, <laughs> he tosses a coin to see who the next champion's going to be. Yeah, yeah, which is so like, screwed up. My, the, my golden goose is dead, and uh, the old one there who had a shot. Mm, I don't know. And uh, carries back, and he's kind of short. So but we also we we do get a, a a representation of depression, which I think is like the first one on this show that is actually good since maybe like secret window which is not a great movie but it is a very good representation of what depression does to somebody yeah and uh this this one is is it's pretty accurate man where like you just become where he's just in void bed. and you're just and you can't. you're thinking about everything at the same time and you can't really process it and it yeah. just cripples you um yeah and he starts becoming a bit manic too because um so the care like the Carrie Von Eric stuff happens. He wins the title. There's that scene where that really haunting scene, because you know it's I knew it was coming, where 
you know, he's just won the belt. He's he's just in the he's in the kitchen with the carries in the kitchen with the lights turned off. He's he's got his hand on the NWA title. And Kevin walks in and he's like, Are you good, man? Like you you should be on the top of the world. And he's like, I can't come down. Like I can't not I can't come down. I'm too high off like yeah. drugs and life and steroids, and I'm just and I'm drunk and now I gotta go ride my motorcycle. Me. Now I'm going to go yeah. for a bike ride. I do have one question for you guys before we move to, to this next part. I remember when I was a kid, like seeing footage of old wrestling stuff all the time. And so many of them were like broad daylight stadium wrestling matches. And like, it would be like daytime and like Hulk Hogan or like Ric Flair would be coming out and they'd be like fighting in like an open sky wrestling match. Like like an amphitheater sink. Yeah, yeah. But that that doesn't happen anymore. Am I wrong? Like I don't I've never no, seen that in modern happens. even for like the last like 25 years I don't know if I've seen that. Certain like that. WrestleManias happen in open air arenas. Right. They just happen later so you only get like an hour Most of it like being outside. Um tradition in the 70s and 80s, okay? Right wrestling shows would start at like 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. So the main event would be going on at like 6 or 7 p.m. So that's why when it was an open air arena, it was always like the main event or the big matches were happening um, in what seemed like the daytime. When Vince McMahon came in and created pay-per-view and created that whole thing, that it shifted to like Sunday nights at Eight, the show would start right yeah so in the summer sometimes if it's like summer slams and Ro wrestlemania specifically are in bigger arenas so you'll get the you know the, like the sky dome if you go back and even watch i think it's wrestlemania 19 mm -hmm. there's the sky dome is open and there's daytime stuff happening right. and that's that's relatively recent and uh there was a there was a wrestling event that happened uh two years ago in in ireland in a like a the castle the stadium that's like kind of shaped like a castle the, once again outdoor had to start earlier for people back in the states because of the time the time difference mm -hmm. so it does happen but you're right it, the, in the olden days <laughs> <laughs> there in was the a, old times the before shows Vince started at man like and his evil took over yeah. before pay-per-view pay-per-views mm. Dwayne the Rock Johnson <laughs> he rock bottomed his way into our hearts and I don't think that Dwayne the Rock Johnson is at rock bottom in any way <laughs> no his <laughs> his move was called the rock bottom oh I see the move that he did the uh yeah <laughs> I know so, nothing about The Rock other than his like movie career. I don't know mm -hmm. any of it. I know Do that you he used smell to, what The Rock yeah, is cooking. I know that he used to ask people if they could smell stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Can you smell this for me, please? <laughs> hey, long COVID. It's like it's 1998. Yeah, you'll know what long COVID is soon enough, Junior. Uh, yeah. So as soon as he was like, "I'm going for a bike ride," I was a motorcycle ride. I was like, "Oh fuck!" This <laughs> audience is about to go silent when they realize what happens mm -hmm. and uh during this too we get that shot of kevin and his wife at the like what's the name of your baby and he says like his mom's maiden Wait, name hold the phone man there's what? so much that happens in this little brief stint. oh yeah they reveal the one leg before that i'm sorry but they but even before that like this is when i when i don't take a million notes okay but I'm it's talking about filmmaking. I'm not talking about wrestling at this point. Okay. I'm talking about like the movie itself. Mm -hmm. um, we get the scene of uh, mom watching Carrie on TV as he's winning. Right. And yeah. we see a ghost on the stairs. And yeah. you know, obviously it's not meant to be a literal ghost. It's like she is being haunted by her son's death or whatever. And this is her yeah. second son to die. She looks behind her. She gets a shiver or whatever. Like, uh. But, you know, it's not like it's it's well played and and you get it you're not yeah it's it's understated and it's not overbearing yeah and, it's and, not the, and the movie hitting is, you over the head and the movie is so grounded throughout that like something like that you can do and it's it's meant to be evocative or, or provocative i suppose like in in terms of like this is what her mind is at like she's watching her son who's about to become the champion 
Mm -hmm. but her son who was supposed to be the champion is is dead right like she's she's guess, thinking she's thinking about her other I was just going to say she's clearly thinking about yeah. everybody at the same time yeah. it's also a great moment to kind of like most of the time we just see what the dad and the brothers are up to to kind of see her when they're not there that like when there's not a bunch of guys talking about wrestling or a bunch of guys there practicing wrestling she's yeah. just there watching them wrestle on TV and she's just thinking about She's thinking about her sons. She's not thinking about what's going to be and like how how you know the championship is not what matters. It's it's her yeah. her, her kids, man, her little boys. Yeah. And um while this is happening, you know, you get he wins. He wins the match and you hear like the new world champion and then it cuts to I believe the tree that he kills himself <laughs> under at the end of the movie. But there's also another tree beyond it that has this like hanging patch of of like wisp to it that it looks like someone's hanging in the tree. And I'm like, oh, man, like on, on second viewing, I was like, this is seriously if they plan this, this is crazy. <laughs> this is wild. <laughs> it looks like a person hanging themselves from this tree as he's being like the world champion of the world, hanging himself from a tree, Gary Von <laughs> But uh, that, that's that scenery of, of that, that homestead that like yeah. anywhere Americana look where it's, it's slowly becoming this haunted, sad place. Um, yeah. And, and there's, it's hard to kind of spell out exactly how that's being accomplished as the movie continues. I but think it, it, I, it, it honestly is just the the storytelling that's that's doing that because they could show yeah. the same shots at the beginning of the mu movie and you'd be like, isn't that beautiful? But then halfway yeah. through showing it paired with, you know, the fact that she's seeing ghosts of her dead kids, it's making you look at it differently, right? It's yeah, it's good. This movie's good, guys. I don't know if you know this. Movie. This movie's it's good. a it's a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> good movie. So yeah, he uh, that we get the reveal that he lost his leg. Um, which that got that got a visible that, that got an audible gasp an from audible the audience. audience. The theater. Yeah, I remember that too. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it was it was it was it was uh, framed so well too because he gets up, he like snorts a bunch of painkillers because he's clearly been in an accident. We don't know how, how long it's been. It must have been a month later, or whatever. And no, it's that that stump later. is healed, baby. That's yeah. like that's like eight to a year. Like that's a long time. Yeah. It's it's quite a while, because like, in reality, I think uh, Kerry, um, uh, they he didn't lose his foot initially, and 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 in the healing process, he started stepping on it too soon, and it ended up damaging too much, and then they had to uh, amputate. Oh, I, th I, th I think was was that what actually happened on brand for the von. Oh, <laughs> Honor. I keep wanting to say Von Buten. <laughs> the Von Buten boys always up to no good on their, but the, on their yeah, the Von, green limbs. <laughs> the Von Erics. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. If the, they had only named one of their children Eric, it would make it so much easier for me because I'd be like, Eric Von Eric. <laughs> Well, of, the, he, uh, of the von eric brothers yeah. he, won, he went to, and had his like most of his career in the wwf without a foot and he never told anybody he won the intercontinental title with that's one of the craziest one parts about this entire story to me is that he was wrestling professionally and successfully with one foot for like a well, long time when mm. michael von in this next sequence when michael von eric gets injured right and he gets uh uh, he gets toxic shock syndrome and gets like brain damage. They're having that that fucking press conference, and he's like basically like can't even talk. And Kevin's like, "Yeah, he'll be back in the ring. He'll be back in the ring. It's all good, everybody. Don't don't you worry." Not to interrupt, yeah. but when we were seeing this in theater, <laughs> I think when his foot reveal happened and the gasp happened, I think I audibly out, out loud like went, "Holy shit!" Like just to. <laughs> see what happened and you both giggled and people giggled around us like they were, they were. Holy, shit. <laughs> holy shit holy shit yeah yeah, his foot go? yeah holy <laughs> when like, did that happen this is Before back when drinking and driving was like normal. perfectly acceptable yeah you're allowed yeah. to do it as long as you're like not near a you know downtown city core mm -hmm. where there's people walking around uh but yeah it was shocking it, like the I, I think everything leading up to it, like the, the fact that they draw it out is 
perfect, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's called good filmmaking. Guys. Called this filmmaking. movie's good. <laughs> this movie's good. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mentioned that Kevin. Like, we get that little scene where he's like, oh, "We're cursed," so he's like spiraling. Yeah. Uh, then the whole sequence I mentioned here, where the, <laughs> Fritz is like, "Like, I got no more golden geese." Uh, what about the skinny music one? He mm. fucking almost dies for for that, but then he ends up being like the most heart one of the most heartbreaking scenes in a series of heartbreaking scenes is him trying to pick up his guitar and he mm. can't play it and then yeah. he goes to the bathroom and just like pills beer. Well, we wood. should talk about this a little bit because there is, this is a, a large chunk, right? Where he's like mm-hmm. they bring him back, they they put him up in front of the press. His dad is like scathing in the corner like staring daggers at him while he's trying to talk and like you can tell that his dad is like I don't want to say disgusted but he's like he is not pleased with his he's performance st- he's... on Mike but it's like he's been brain damaged man like his yeah, his yeah. And, and he's like he's still taking things personally and he's blame you know blaming on a curse but he's always taking these things as a personal slight against him that like this is what I want. This is what what I have decided for the family. And every time there's a setback, every time there's this uh, curb to step over, he, he takes it personally and 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 then overreacts to it and, and makes uh, dramatic course changes. Yeah, um, yeah. And then we we also get. Um, I mean, he. We were talking about it earlier. Where like a, a tiny thing can go wrong in a, a wrestling match, and it can it can be tragic. You know, there are literally examples that I, we haven't really talked about on, on this episode, but like, I think we all remember when, uh, you know, Hart died. Oh, when Hart, mm-hmm. like that was just an accident. Right. Yeah. And it, it doesn't have to be that, that extreme or dramatic. It can just be somebody getting dropped on the wrong way on their neck or on their, and in this case on their shoulder and it, they have to get surgery and it, it causes Oops. some sort yeah. of complication, right? All, all sorts of near misses in, in reality of wrestling. Like I think what's his name? Mick Foley, the guy who was cactus Jack. Yeah. Like he's had all sorts of near misses. Well, in 1998, the undertaker threw him off the top of hell in a cell, which yeah. is a meme, but it's also that happened. And the crazy part about that is, he runs out at the beginning, climbs up. Undertaker didn't know that was going to happen, first of all. He was like, oh, fuck. I'm 6'9". I have to now climb, like, a 20-foot cage. So they get up there. They they wrestle around a bit. He, Mick Foley whispers into Undertaker's ear, throw me. And Undertaker's like, what? And he's like, do it. And Mankind, he's, he's Mankind. Is that the guy who had, like, a puppet on his hand and, like, a yeah. half bag on his face or whatever? Yeah, but... <laughs> he had, a, like, a mask. <laughs> yeah. I went as him for Halloween one year. Anyway, um, he falls off, and, like, he fell through the table, but the usually the tables break or fall a little. He just fucking obliterates the table. When he hit the ground, his he broke, like, three of his teeth, and they went up out of his nose. So there's a picture of him lying there with, like, a tooth hanging out of his nose, right? <laughs> That's not even where it gets crazy. What the fuck? Why is somebody trying to get into the building? It's Mick Foley calling you. Being like, <laughs> Stop talking about me on your podcast. So they start <laughs> taking Mick Foley out on a stretcher. Like, that's the end, right? Mick Foley gets off the stretcher, starts climbing the cage again. Gets he, like, blows all his teeth out of the nose? Like- yep. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. It's back up to the top where the Undertaker's still up there, like, shocked. And then another horrible thing happened. The middle of the cage at the top isn't supposed to fall, okay? But when Undertaker choke slammed him, he fell through the top of the cage. And then another horrible thing happened. There were chairs up there. All the other teeth on the other side went out the <laughs> other nostril. It's like, holy fuck. There were folding chairs up on top of Hell in a Cell, okay? From the match, like from their hardcore ridiculous nonsense that was happening. And when he fell through the cage and hit fell to the ground and hit the mat a chair came down with him and hit him in the face again and he survived all of that yeah like that that i think for me that particular match is one that rivals uh hulk hogan versus andre the giant which was one of his last matches and like no if like a von eric was involved in that match everybody he would have like lost all his limbs and (laughs) all his hair would have got burned off yeah, um, yeah. That's so. Just to just to put that in perspective, Michael Von Eric takes a body slam and ends up killing himself because he gets brain damage so bad that he's shunned well, he gets, from his family. So he gets uh, put into the hospital and they're they're there, and then the doctor comes out and he's like, "So 
the surgery did not go as planned. He got a crazy 200. It was like a 200 fever, which is wild. Like that's that like bakes your brain. Yeah. yeah. His brain was baked. Yeah. And then he suffered from toxic shock syndrome, which to me, toxic shock sounds like a, a heel in a wrestling world. Like, I'm toxic shock and I'm coming for you. But, <laughs> but it's I, a female uh, wrestler. Cause the implication is that her tampon was in too long. <laughs> Because you can get toxic shock syndrome from tampons. Okay. I'll, uh, <laughs> goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that, that was something I had to kind of look up myself was like, is this a real thing? Toxic shock syndrome? And like, it is like a, a result of a, of a, uh, unforeseen bacterial infection that can Which happen during like, surgery. Like blood. Yeah. Like too much blood, like bad blood inside your body. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, wrestling is crazy. Um, but, but he he doesn't die, but he, like we said, he, he he goes into a coma, and then when he wakes up, they parade him around, and it's disgusting. Yeah, um, and you can even you can even tell. I mean, I don't know how it was in reality, but even in the movie, you can tell that uh, Kevin is like, "Why are we? Why are we doing this? Like, what the? Fuck yeah, like, he's so half invested when he's doing the press conference, and I mean, like, where his patter was garbage before, but now, like, there, there's not even any emotion behind what he's saying to to, to everybody, and I, and I guess at, at that point, that's where he started to take a more managerial position with his yeah. father's wrestling company. He tries to teach Carrie how to wrestle again on one leg. He sort of takes the books for the for the wrestling company mm -hmm. at the sportatorium, and uh, we get that before Michael Smithers. Killed... I need to go down to the sportatorium <laughs> <laughs> before um, Michael actually plays the play doesn't play his guitar, and then and then offs himself. Yeah. We get that really sweet conversation with uh, and Michael his and his mom. Yeah. Which was well, really... this is where like he realizes, I think that like he probably could have been an artist. Yeah, his mom. His mom was an artist. His dad was an artist, and they both decided, no, like we're not going to be artists. We have to focus on what matters, which is raising you guys. Or I mean, mom focused on raising you guys, and dad focused on making my children. <laughs> dad was like, if you're not first, you're last. Yeah, champions yeah. of the world. Um, and it's, it's extremely tragic and, heart and heartbreaking to, to realize like, you know, you don't even, you don't see this painting, but his, his mom is talking about like, that's where I, that's the house I grew up in. I painted that painting and he's like, why didn't you tell anybody? And she doesn't really have a good reason. And yeah. you don't actually get her reason throughout, but I think you can sort of infer it, which is that like. One, nobody ever asked, which is kind of shit. But also, like, she is a piece of this family, and she's not the main piece, you know? Like, she she's there for other reasons. She's not there yeah. to inspire. She's there to make breakfast and kiss you on the forehead when you're sick. But she's not there to uh, inspire you to be something else, which is like, oh, my God, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> it, like, she... she the painting when they reveal it is like amazing. Like it, it's an amazing painting. And you realize that like, she could have inspired him to become an artist as well, instead of who is the inspirer of the family, her stupid fucking husband, the, the cause of the curse. Yeah. Like he's the reason that, you know, he's, he he's, and he's suppressing everyone's actual innate abilities. And yeah, yeah like it, it, it is like, and, and for those that can, associate with this kind of stuff it is very frustrating where you think like, like like if it wasn't for not just not that you want that this father to be gone but like just make some different choices because like these th these things are impacting others and but it's not even like he he didn't even let him have a chance before two of his children had already died he was like keeping them in reserve like it's like this sort of like, yeah the gun cabinet at that we get later where it's like I yeah. have this and I can use this one later. If I, if this one doesn't work, I can use this one. And it's like, mm -hmm. he's, he's treating them like it's very utilitarian. Like, yeah. Like yeah. ammunition. And it's, it's fucking terrible. Man. And then mm -hmm. the, one of the most heartbreaking scenes of the whole movie is uh, just the, when they're 
out searching for Michael, and it's that faraway shot of them like doing that thing where you you uh, the search pattern, yeah. search pattern through a perimeter, and, uh, and it's just the family, which is yeah fucked. It's not even and like there's a bunch of cops or anything there. It's like no, it's just just them. Mm-hmm. And they find him, and it's it's just, it never like zooms in. It doesn't show. They just all run to him, and then you then it just the scene kind of cuts away. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is when we get the scene I was talking about earlier about Dottie trying to put on the dress, and Pam's like, "We got to go," and she's like, "I can't wear this again." And uh, you know, we see shots of like Kevin's home life and stuff. Like he can't deal with the kids; he's sleeping in the office. I think that's a pretty important scene too, though, is when she. She's burying two of her sons within such a, such a short period of time that she hasn't bought new clothes, and she's looking at the dress and she can't. Yeah, she can't bring herself to put it on because she's like, everyone down there is gonna recognize my dress from the last time I buried my son, and like, I you know I don't think that anybody can imagine processing that sort of information. And I don't know if this is real or if this is like just tailored for the movie, but it is something that I think somebody would, would go through, right? Like, yeah, because it's very much in the sense that like, and, and this is what makes part of in addition of everything else, what makes this such a great movie is what she's talking about with that dress is not what she's actually not. It's not what's actually happening. It, she's in such a denial of like, I don't want to, go into this situation again so soon is what it is. It's, right. It's not that being seen in this particular dress, she's making it about the dress, but it's not about that. It's that it's about her not accepting the situation happening again for the third time for yeah, 100%. And then, you know, if you were to, t- if you take it to like a more cinematic level, it's like, she doesn't want to rank her sons in the same way that she, that her husband is ranking them. Right. Like, so like, I didn't buy a new outfit for this son. I consider the son to be like, you know, not, not worthy of me buying a new outfit, meaning he's lower on the ranking, which is like the whole movie is, is just about like, dad's dad's shitty ranking system. (laughs) That's what this movie should have been called. So the iron claw colon dad's shitty ranking system. So <laughs> luckily and on, and unfortunately, the next sequence is Kevin gets his shot at the title again against one. Rick Flair. <laughs> oh, who's this guy? He's, he looks like he wears a lot of lizard skin. Am I Old right? lizard skin Jones. He, he looks like I used to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Before the plane crash. <laughs> Look at that. Look at Look those at that tights. cleft chin. It looks like somebody just poked some Play-Doh. <laughs> you, you, that, that could operate as a gravy boat, that chin. Like, yeah. Yeah. He did, you do shots out of it. He probably did shot. He probably pulled a shot in his chin and like a little party trick with it back and longest line, shortest ride. <laughs> I wonder, do you have to like, when you wash your face, do you have to like give some extra attention to the Q tip? Q tip, yeah. Q tipping my chin dimple. <laughs> Um, and this sequence is great. Okay, so I will reveal how I feel about this. I oh, thought man. that the I was almost in tears talking about that scene earlier, and now I'm talking about chin dimples. It's time for levity, Stephen. Mm. All right, let's go. Um, the uh, his performance I thought was really good. I think the guy knew the source material. I think that he didn't look like. I know you guys are saying like it doesn't matter that he didn't look like him. Mm. I wanted specifically Ric Flair to look like Ric Flair to be the one big like. I got Harley Race, so I'm happy. Um, and I think that was the problem on the internet. Everybody was expecting this like over the top portrayal of Ric Flair, but it was it was, great. it was as grounded as the rest of the movie is. So that's sort of where I'll leave it on that note. Um, but this part is heartbreaking because they have a knockdown drag out, and the same fucking thing happens except reversed, where Ke- where Kevin freaks out and puts on the Iron Claw. And that's one of my kind of issues with this movie where even though they explain kayfabe at the beginning, it still seems like in a match, they're really fighting because obviously that DQ finish was like pre predetermined with the claw and everything. But 
he loses by disqualification this time and the title doesn't change hands. And then when they go to the back, he's sitting there like stewing and Ric Flair comes to the back, like good job, kid. Like you really put it all out there. You did a great job. He's got his, his hair is all. It's honestly like red. one of my favorite parts of the movie. It's amazing. It's great. You're, yeah. it, it, it contrasts like, like the, the mood of the, of, of uh, Fritz Everybody. and, and, and uh, Carrie were like, you know what the hell happened out there, and 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 uh, they're like disappointed him. And then Ric Flair comes in. He's like, "You could we do a match anytime. Wait, man, we'll yeah. just get a drink after this." And it's like he says, "Where can we go to get fucked up? Like, let's yeah. get yeah. fucked up together right now." Yeah, and like, but it, it was like it was interesting, like a positive in a way, in a weird way. But like somebody positive comes in to kind of give such contrast and show like how fucked up things are with his family. Yeah. That that uh, he, this this no no it's all part of the game and and we're we're good we're good. So like yeah. I'm not like a huge Ric Flair head in the world of wrestling, but like yes. I think from beginning of of his intro to end of the scene where he just walks out being like, all right, well if you change your mind, just you know let me know. I'll be at the Holiday Inn. He's just mm. gonna go back to the Holiday Inn and get fucking wasted in the the bar of the hotel yeah and get and, his short ride ready yeah, exactly. <laughs> and like everything else is like so <laughs> intense just like the entire movie everything is so intense and he he comes in and, he, and it's it's like we just put on the best fucking show that i've maybe ever been a part of yeah this is crazy i can't believe how wild you went like let, let's do this again at any at any moment and like like you said, Tim, it, it just like it shows that like there are people in this industry that are like, no, this is great. Like this is theater. We are we're performers. We're 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 we have a craft, just like Sir Ian McKellen or whatever on the, on the stage, and we're yeah. we're giving it to people. Whenever you want, come back. And he's sitting here stewing in the the locker room with his dad, who's like, you're never gonna be what I need you to be, and his mm -hmm. brother, who's like, I. Uh, agree and he's covered in and then he looks at his hand covered in blood and he's like fuck this and he said you know he starts laughing and he's like i have to i have to go back and get my kids and i'm not i i'm not i can't be a part of this anymore and it's yeah it's good man very good yeah and uh this is the the bit where fritz is kind of like i want to give you the company and kevin talks to that uh that announcer guy and the announcer's like those books are so fucking cooked from 30 years of just your dad yeah. being insane yeah, yeah your dad being insane man like nobody ever got paid there was no money but he made it look like we were the biggest biz and uh then he has that talk with his dad that's like i know you cooked the books i need to sell this so my family can thrive instead of just being in the same bullshit you've been putting us through i'm not doing that to my kids ironically his those kids do wrestle now <laughs> It's a bit yeah. better. It's better, I assume. It's probably did everything the different than his dad did, but uh, the mentality here is like I don't want to bring my kids into that world. So, you know, things get a bit better for a minute until that Christmas where Carrie shows up brandishing a weapon, <laughs> brandishing a gun. <laughs> he's not brandishing it. He gives no, it to him in a box. <laughs> it's true, but he's like, let's go shoot it. Yeah. That's is and, that a uh, thing? Like I, I don't know a lot about guns, but like is that is that a traditional thing where if you give a gun to somebody as a gift, you're meant to go if you're in Texas, with them, probably like, maybe I, right away. Maybe yeah. Uh, I, I I I've ne never li like never lived in a household with a gun, uh, so like you the ID in Canada, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it's a little different uh, for for what I experienced and many others. Yeah, what about Canada these guns? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Bam, um, but uh, yeah, that just most certainly if someone gave a gun at Christmas, that would give alarm in my household. And um, and then if someone said, "Let's go shoot it," I uh, would be like, "Maybe after dinner." You're like in, the, a, the in gun, a suburb in Ontario. You're the like, gun uh, thing is weird I don't think because so. in one of the establishing shots at the very beginning of the movie, those shots of just the house, mm -hmm. they show the gun, Fritz's gun rack, and he's got like. 30 guns so yeah obviously he's a gun collector so that wasn't weird the mom even she, carrie's like let me give you your gift it's now and the weird. mom's it's like it's weird. christmas let's wait till christmas and he's like i want to give him that gun now 
<laughs> that was a little weird. That was a little off point. Yeah. Well, it's because yeah. he, he wasn't going to be there on Christmas. Yeah, because so he's, he's like, going to go win the, the Intercontinental gun. title. Or, yeah. No, because he has to go to Mexico to decompress or whatever he said. Yeah. We're, gonna, we're leaving on Christmas Day to go to Mexico because I need a, a break or whatever. Mm-hmm. And like, <clears throat> he gives it to him and his dad pulls it out and he's like, wow, it's beautiful. Very nice gun. And I'm always like, you okay. better not kill anybody who describes head. a gun as beautiful as a weird pervert but <laughs> yeah also, <laughs> also like you know whatever i guess if your dad likes guns you get him again and then uh he's like let's go shoot it and he's like no <laughs> no not, yeah. not happening not happening right now yeah and he freaks out he's like what the fuck what the fuck you, yeah. you gotta fucking shoot it right now and then his mom is like what's wrong with you Karen? And he's like what's wrong with me what's wrong with him he doesn't want to shoot the gun i just gave him yeah um, I, it, like, like clearly, like, like he's showing signs of his substance abuse and his stress yeah. and his man- manias. That's and that's the point of it, right? Is he's he's meant to seem unhinged. Even the t-shirt he's wearing is like that's not a Christmas t-shirt. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> that's, that's a summertime t-shirt, man. What are you doing? <laughs> I wear yeah. sleeveless tees at Christmas all the time. <laughs> uh, and, a sleeveless uh, knitted sweater, <laughs> at least mm, at the very least. An- another point of it that was like, I don't know if it was necessary characterization because. In real life, Carrie had uh, uh, at least, I think, two kids uh, at that point. And uh, I, I'm not too sure if he was still married or not, but um, the, it kind of just brings a, a random uh, lady that they hadn't met yet. And, they, and, and it was just kind of like some person that he met on the road or whatever. Yeah. So I'm not I too sure if, if wrestlers he was like to... separated from his wife and kids or something and like that still could have been accurate to the time, but like, again, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, think, I think it's meant to Mexico. Mm-hmm. I think what it, what it does is in the scene proceeding shows the unhinged nature where, you know, they're like, what about Clarice or whatever the fuck her name was? <laughs> and like, he's like, what, who? And he's like, Clarice, the girl you brought to Christmas. And he's like, I don't even remember that. Was that her name? Like, yeah. He doesn't. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't so, like, matter removed from everything that he he can't even remember the name of the person he brought to christmas well even after the christmas meltdown uh he he kevin uh, meets carrie in the kitchen to say like hey you doing okay he's like yeah yeah why he's like because you just had a shouting match over a gun a <laughs> moment you're, ago you're clearly on <laughs> with mom and dad at the <laughs> yeah. same time yeah you were very but, visibly on cocaine right now yeah, yeah. and then he, I, like he's like let me get a look at you like they all say, that's what their like whole thing is. Like, let me get a look at you, and, and then they say, "You look strong," and it's like, yeah. Jesus <laughs> Christ!" Yeah. And then he headbutts them to get him to stop looking at him. Stop! <laughs> stop looking at me! And then uh, I don't know if it's the it's it's later. I assume he's calling from Mexico, and he kind of gives the call to be like, "I don't want to live no more. I can't do it. I'm too no, stressed he's out." From uh, the hotel the street or whatever. Like he he goes. He oh, that was like later that night. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, I think this is like meant to be later after Christmas on like months. Later oh, like months yeah. later, because they, they they do show him. They do show like a TV of him winning the Intercontinental title at SummerSlam. Mm-hmm. So it has to be after SummerSlam 1990. Yeah, the SummerSlam is uh, is when he when uh, Zach Efron is like, I'm thinking about uh, selling selling the the business or whatever and then his dad's okay. like if you sell the business you're not welcome through this door again just so you know this is how i talk i break up my sentences like this <laughs> to, to make sure that you understand the important parts are important i called yeah. the angry shatner <laughs> people who talk to me like that don't talk to me again that's how i read my narrations and i <laughs> like it <laughs> so yeah so basically very sad um kevin is like oh shit i have to get to the house and even though the parents are around carrie still makes it to the tree with a gun and as kevin walks up he sees the car with the door open he hears a a bang and then yeah it's i mean i'm sure it didn't happen that way in real life but like it is very cinematic but yeah it was Mm -hmm. um I, in terms of the narrative of this movie i assume that he would be sitting by that tree just waiting for someone to come up and no one did like he he went he he got to his parents house his dad is working on 
whatever fences for non-existent <laughs> horses or whatever the fuck like what the, like you know they're like he's constantly getting to build fences and like you never see one piece of livestock on this fucking ranch oh, yeah you know? when they're moving yeah. fences around at the start of the yeah. movie yeah and he's yeah he's barking at mike yeah, at the beginning and, um uh, you, you you like i i don't know like i assume if you're sitting there with a gun planning to kill yourself and you've gone to a place where you assume someone would come to help you stop you from doing that and no one does it's probably a very devastating feeling like just waiting like is anyone going to come help me and then you see the one person that you know probably could stop you but yeah. you, but you want the people who really probably couldn't stop you mm -hmm. yeah the dad and mom are not going to be able to stop me from doing this but eric or sorry kevin is the one that could yeah and i get it man i i understand it it makes sense to me like you would you would be like no because he's gonna get me to stop and i don't want to stop so he would that's why he would pull the trigger when he sees his brother uh coming out right mm -hmm. so yeah and he, it, and he reached out to kevin first with the phone and that kind of cascading from there yeah. like it, it's a very visible series of events that like is just all all too real for for sadly too many people but um uh it, it's uh like the, the the that that punctuating moment of it though is like where we talked about uh this homestead is slowly becoming this haunted place and like this is kind of where it's come to a head that like yeah. from here on in that's it this this place is a uh, absolutely broken home no yeah. coming back it's very heartbreaking when he carries them in and puts them on the caught the kitchen table too or the like the yeah. dining room table like that that part got me again today um and right before that fritz walks over he's like what the hell's going on run 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 and oh, right. kevin's like well you do not understand the magnet like the have the ma magnitude of the situation the magneto of what you've done here <laughs> and he fucking <laughs> uses his magneto powers to pull the iron out of his blood it's crazy <laughs> He pulled the iron right out of his claws. <laughs> <laughs> he strangles, he tries to strangle him to death in a very intense scene. I mean, mm -hmm. if he didn't stop, he would have. He would him have. To death. Yeah. 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 And, and, but it's also rep, kind of representative of like finally someone has overpowered the dad that like he's yeah. been kind of dethroned it's the final at that battle moment. Battle. Yeah, that like there's there's even when he was confronting his dad before about cooking the books, it, it was very timid. I did what I need to, yeah, like yeah, and and he was like, but dad, I I know it's not quite. He wasn't even being like too accusatory about it. He was still like kind of approaching this in a very open and somewhat forgiving manner. That like but this is what we've got to do. Yeah, I added everything up. It doesn't make sense. I didn't make nearly as much money as as you said I did. And then he says what do you think all of this was a free ride? And he like looks around at the house and like, you realize like, Oh, he was taking all this, all these earnings and like, and again, cooking the books, but he was like building a life yeah. around them. And like, he was taking money from his kids and it's like, that's fucking wild. Like, it's, it yeah. Wild. And he has absolutely no regrets about it. Like, because it's all wild. about, all about him and he sees nothing wrong with it. Yeah. And so then, yeah, when Kevin overpowers him and it's just this rage filled moment uh, and, and he, sees his father like you know finally on the ground finally pushed down and in, in, in a weak, weak and vulnerable state that's when he's like like it's it's all changed now the relationship is completely different now and we never get another another dad speech after that like no. it's like he choked the speeches right out of his ass and, yeah, yeah. Get the, right after this we get the scene of all the the boys reuniting in heaven which is just sort of a nice little you know you can leave kind of happy um in wrestling, the he, the face like typically wins. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. At, we, like, can't just just skip, me... we cannot skip over the heaven scene. I'm not skipping over. It. I'm talking about it. Okay. In professional wrestling, um, the, not at like the big on TV shows, the at house shows, the untelevised shows, they want to send the, the the crowd home happy. So the heel is vanquished, and the and then the face will give. A speech and that's what this bit this ending reminds me of we get to see a very nice moment with the boys reuniting in heaven right and then and then we get some more sadness with kevin which we'll talk about in a sec and then some more levity when you realize that the the lineage will go on it'll be better but what right. did you want to say about the the, the heaven well 
All I wanted to say is that th this this sequence in a movie is something that like 99% of the time should never ever work at all. Mm -hmm. It's Roger Bink it's, shows up as a force ghost. <laughs> yeah, like it, it's stupid, it's dumb. Like a lot of people will roll their eyes. And like as it started, like when he comes out and he's he, his both his feet are there and he's jumping around on his two feet. I was like, "Oh my god, are we getting it?" like a heaven sequence right now. And I had like prepped my brain to be like, this is, this is not happening. Like, this is going to be so stupid. And then I realized as it was going like, Oh, this is extremely quaint and nice. And it's not meant to be literal. It's meant to be, you know, like you know, they talk about God, the entire fucking movie. These people clearly believe in God. This is just, you know, Kevin's well, Kevin's interpretation of what would happen if his brother died, mm -hmm. he would go meet his other brothers on a dock, and then they would meet little baby uh, brother. Just so we can use this <laughs> <laughs> happening inside of his head while Kevin Kevin's sitting watching. His he's cutting back to him, and he's or I don't know if it keeps cutting back to him, but like not, not until the very end of it. Yeah, yeah not puts until him down, this. and then you know he, this this moment happens it's absolutely wonderful like it, it's beautiful and it's like yeah. all the good parts of these characters that you've seen throughout the movies that the way they interact with each other and like there's you know i don't know if one of the parents had died would they be there i don't know because like they these characters only really give a shit or not even give a shit just love their brothers like they, mm -hmm. they love their mm -hmm. brothers so fucking much it's crazy mm -hmm. um and i don't know how did you guys feel about this like i i well, thought it worked really really well considering it's something that should never work in any movie but it worked the same well. series of thoughts that you did i was like oh no is it gonna be but then it was just like sweet because like the little the brother that died when he was five is also there you know so yeah. the whole movie has been That's a the moment where, where i was like this isn't supposed to work why am i liking this? exactly why oh, the am brothers... i liking that the little kid who's like you must be my little bro and then you realize oh it's zach efron the brothers palled it. around so much during the whole movie that of course this makes sense in that context if they didn't show all those scenes of them just like doing stuff together and then they're like i'll see you when you get there plays well like these guys are like ding, ding, yeah ding, ding, ding. like that would be lame but it was just very like it was only three minutes it just shows them all reuniting next to like the little brook that they all went in but it's, on it's clearly very obvious that it's, it's that kind of magic yeah yeah but like this is this is the happiest place i can think of for my brothers that i love so much and, and you're right like it's that same dock from when they were doing that uh, river rafting uh moment together where, tubing, yeah so like this is a clearly a place that we like to bond at and so and 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 you're kind of right steve that like you know if the parents died where they've been there but like this is specifically they didn't reunite in the heaven version of their home they reunited in the heaven version of the dock of that little field or of, of uh, Kevin. Like that's Kevin's. That's that's Kevin's Kevin's vision of it. He shared that dock with all of them, right? Like he did. Yeah. Even the one that died before all the other ones met him, right? Like the yeah, oldest but he brother beats... died before any of them could have met him. Yeah. Yeah, and then, and then, and they make a point where Carrie's like, so like, oh, you're my older, you're 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 my older brother. Okay. Yeah, like and... that. That is a thing that like in most scenario like a star wars scenario you'd be like holy fuck get the fuck out of here where is count yeah. dooku already let me see count dooku again <laughs> I, I think the 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 word as to why this works is because it's subtly tasteful because it's not overbearing mm -hmm. they're not they're not trying to inform you of how to feel about this with music too much i, I think it's actually very quiet and you're just hearing nature sounds and they're just doing little punctuated things of like it's not just that they're in heaven, but like he's got his foot back, and and the fact that it does end where it's it's directly shot of Kevin, where it's just like okay, it's it's not literally a heaven scene, but this is what we all want for them, and uh, and so I think because it's that and it's not completely spelled out and it's left for a little bit of interpretation, but it, it, it's not overbearing. I think that's why it works so well. And like in, in the hands of anybody else, 
like it, it would be like like oh, oh boy now we're going to see station from from bogus journey in a moment <laughs> yeah. it would have been like uh the end of big fish <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah like we're like running through everyone's lives being like remember when this happened remember this but, I, but know, yeah, I like a list is more. Good. The end of Big Fish is good. I like the end of Big Fish. I'm not gonna. Just... And it, it it lives up for Big Fish. But yeah. th this is a movie where yeah, like like for something like this, where you, as you're saying, Jason, where when you're trying to cap off a home show with giving um, uh, a, 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 a a winning face to all of this after all this tragedy, yeah. for all this struggle, uh, this is the the winning face for it is is seeing peace and happiness for these brothers that are together with each other, which appropriately leads into what comes next for the rest of the movie. Yeah. It's just like the next scene, uh, he gets to finally have the speech and the speech is just about love and peace and, you know, be good to your brother. And I used to be a brother. Now I'm just by myself, but now that I have you, I can see that, you know, you, you get to have a different life. And then we, and then that's the end of the movie and it's just, you know, yeah. it, and, and also, um, uh, the mom, uh, like he, the dad comes back in, Fritz yeah. comes back in. He's like, well, what's for dinner? She's the right. world champion. She goes and she beats Ric Flair for the belt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, right. This, I, I, um, yeah, I, I think that the scene with him and his, and his boys is where he just goes, sits, he, he goes and sits down and watches them play. And he just, you know, starts to cry. Yeah. Missing and his you, brothers. You know, you've already, you know, you've, you've put yourself through that. And obviously this is like months, maybe even like a year later again, where mm -hmm. he's, he's dealt with the, the, but I mean, the heaven thing is him dealing with it all where he's like, they're all together now. I don't have to worry about any of my brothers anymore. They're all gone except for yeah. me. The only person that I need to worry about is me, my wife and my children. Mm -hmm. And he sits down and he, just watches his kids playing and he, he just starts to fucking cry. And it's like you having just watched the iron claw, the movie are like, Oh God, <laughs> this is fucked. <laughs> this is so fucked up. Why yeah. are you making me watch this iron claw? And you start to get upset. But then his children come to him and are like, why are you crying? And he's like, I'm crying because I used to be a brother and I'm right. not anymore. And it makes yeah. me really sad. And they're like, it's okay, dad. You cry, cry all the time. We cry all the time. <laughs> and yeah. he's like, you know what? You guys are right. And he, you know, like, this is sort of like, just show this to a fucking boomer already. You know, like, yeah, don't, <laughs> don't worry about crying. Like crying is like a thing that people need to do sometimes. Yeah. And it's, it's really quite, fucking moving and beautiful man the end of this movie is this is the reason why when jason when you're like that was all right and i was like yeah oh, God. <laughs> oh. It yeah it was lot. all right wasn't it it, it was affected me a lot good. more the second time i'll say that i'll say that much about it um yeah you were still mad about rick flair's was, nose and i wasn't mad about was like rick crying. flair i was defending rick flair walking out because i had been poisoned by the internet going in <laughs> people were like it sucks if rick flair sucks in it and i was like no it was a good it's depiction of rick it's flair the yeah exactly. emotions that you feel when you watch something like this so and, with that um oh no we have to still hold on the top the the scene that tim you brought up where the dad sits down fritz sits down and he says what's for dinner and she's just painting and she's i don't know and, right because yeah. i don't know and it's like this moment where you you know what is to come with these two without them ever having to like infer it or give it to you it's just there it's just there like she's like i am yeah i'm gonna paint and you can maybe make some fucking chicken nuggets you block they, also, <laughs> they split up at some point in real life yeah and probably that's what that was implying that like the, that there's a rift between them now his yeah, pretty his, his authority over everyone is gone i mean mostly like because a, most of the people are gone but there's also like a distance in that frame like she's and you yeah, she, see what she's painting. Like, I assume it's fucking beautiful. Her, yeah, yeah. God damn, this movie's good, guys. I don't know if I said it enough times during I think, this review. I, I think I, I do recall mentioning uh, something about it. 
Let's you know, very... we don't really do good movies on this podcast very True. often. So <laughs> very often. Sometimes it's, it's shocking. That's why we went. Uh, we're at three fifteen right now. Um, let's not, do a not little... since Castaway have we done a movie this good. Let's do a little bit of a. Uh, let's talk about our home alone of it all. Oh God. Uh, uh, Mine's uh, very quick. Uh, Let's be very quick about these quick, last quick. few things. If you had to if pick one, well, what do you think the Home Alone is? The Home Alone of it all. Can someone please tell me when the Home Alone? I really got to know when is the Home Alone of it all. What is the Home Alone of it all? Now that's the Home Alone of it all. When is the Iron Claw of it all? Of it all. What's the Iron Claw of it all? That's every time Fritz is on screen. Uh, just, I just, I just want to say very quickly. I know the guest is supposed to go first, but mine's so simple. It's the wrestling matches. It's the. I just wanted to see how mm. they depicted rest, like the wrestling part. Obviously, I got a lot more than that out of it, but it's the the wrestling matches for me. And uh, Tim, why don't you why don't you go next? Um, this this being like the the immediate reason why. I mean, beyond you just inviting me out, but. Um, the big reason why I was like, okay, yeah, for sure, let's see this movie, was just knowing that it was an A24 film, even though I don't want to necessarily operate by default for these kind of things, but seldom do they disappoint when their their productions are involved. And um, what about it, the whale? No, just kidding. <laughs> I haven't seen the whale yet, but um, the whale. But uh, uh, and, and and this one did not disappoint in that in that regard at all, and. Uh, so you know, when, I, when you're looking at the trailer for it and, um, <laughs> and, and like, <laughs> when he still fucking botched it. I was trying okay. to like make it so that Tim was talking like, <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, so, so yeah. So as far as like the, the, the home of it all for this, as, as far as that's concerned is just, n- in the trailer, just seeing like how gorgeous it all looked. And so when the movie first starts and you do see it in black and white and right away, you're seeing deliberate choices. I kind of was in the zone for the whole time. And, and, and the, and the pacing kind of made it feel very congealed and solid in that sense. Uh, so as, as far as like in, like what in particular, I think everyone can kind of get their own thing more or less, but for me, I, I kind of view it all as, as as the one thing that this one grand saga to tell of this very very sad real story. Fantastic, Steve. Home Alone of it all. <clears throat> I think for me, the Home Alone of it all would have to be the fact that I didn't know anything about the Von. Eric's <laughs> the Von Eric's the Von Buren's of it all <laughs> uh, the Von Eric's and uh, and going in uh, waiting for you know like the moment where I was like I understand who who they are and <clears throat> I don't think that I fully understood that because you know like trailer moments you can get from stuff that you are excited for but like for this I didn't really understand what I was going into it's you know a, a a biopic that spans many decades. And uh, I think for me, it's the coin toss when his dad Mm. decides to base their future on a coin toss, even though he's kind of like already forged their futures for them. And uh, the the starts snowballing out of control where he literally flicks it and it goes into like a black, and white not a black and white but like a a a coin on like a black background the coin flipping i'm like this is when the movie is gonna start to you know we've already had one death but that's when it kind of the curse comes alive well in home alone interestingly enough home alone uh kevin like does thwart them like once briefly right i i feel like before they actually come to the house in in home alone 2 yeah, he throws a bunch of coins, and then Harvey Dent is like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and like falls up in Home Alone when Harvey Dent shows that happens up. Happens in Home Alone too. <laughs> Tommy Lee Jones, Harvey Dent, Dent fights Gotham. Kevin McAllister. <laughs> Do we want to play the hit uh, game show that's sweeping the nation? I would want nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> What's it called again? I can't remember. It's the uh, it's the game the MPAA. It's time to play yeah, against the MPAA. 
Hello and welcome to Guess the MPAA Game. It's me, Kevin, Zach Efron, Von Buren, McAllister. And, I, and McAllister, and I'm here to tell you the rules. The rules are simple. The MPAA certificate rating is the number that's given to every movie on this game show. You will guess that number. The first two digits I will give you, you just have to guess the three digits after that in a five-digit number. This week... The number starts with five, four, ten. What is the MP double A? Great. That's me. Um, five, five, five. Higher, Steven. I'm going to go with eight, eight, eight. Five, four, eight, eight, eight is incorrect. Lower, Tim. Uh. Six six six. It is not five four six six six. <laughs> Steven, final guess. What well, is lower? What's the MP AA certificate number? Oh my god. Five. Four. Three. <laughs> two. One. Two. Thunderbirds are go. Dun, 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 dun. That is incorrect. <laughs> uh, play some sort of fart noise. Uh, Chucky laugh. <laughs> is Chucky laughing at his own fart in that one? <laughs> the MP, you gotta play the, you gotta play the final sting. The MPAA, everyone. The MPAA. Everybody say it. Wow. 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 <laughs> uh, and finally, it is time for our final thoughts. This is the world's longest episode, uh, but I'm okay with it. It's time for our final thoughts. I found this feather sticking out of my pants. So that's my Damn. final thought. <laughs> my final thought. Uh, just like at the beginning, of course, the guest goes first. So Tim, tell us your final thoughts and uh, give us a rating, whether it be a five out of ten or out of a million or a funny rating. Give her hell, bud, and give yourself the iron claw. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, not not a perfect film. We, we talked about a couple of little things here and there, but still a tremendous movie. And um, uh, and, and, and the fact that like they had to uh, withhold on um, uh, like they, they had to remove an entire missing brother from this movie because it was too much sadness too much to tell that like that that kind of gives you an idea uh that like it's it's it, like it's almost an overwhelming story um but it encapsulates a, a, a very interesting time not just for wrestling but for entertainment in general where um that 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 the, the kind of the superb uh operatic drama that was being uh, accompanied by all this, but it's funny that the background, the reality for all these people is um, sometimes even more of a um, tragedy than what they're portraying on stage is, is kind of far out. Um, and the fact that, that this is um, like a, an, an er, you know, early into this person's film directing career uh, for Timothy or well, I think it goes by Sean Durkin, but his full name's Timothy Sean Durkin, so I don't hold that against him. Um, but uh, it's, I, I, and I said that like it's it's re, like such a fully realized story that like usually when you see directors in their early career, you can see raw talent. Like when we were talking about Assault on Precinct Thirteen, there's like raw talent for um, Carpenter there, but but still needs to be refined. Whereas there's a lot here that's already refined, which is shocking, but in a very pleasing manner. And, um, and, and as I mentioned that the, the pacing for this, the whole way through is uh, makes it just very easy to absorb such a massively dramatic story like this. And, and on top of it all, uh, I was a little ready to kind of write off Zac Efron for any kind of dramatic acting, and he managed to do it for this. Now, whether or not he had to uh, get as, 
you know, ultra super jacked for this as he did, it, it, you know, that that's a personal choice. But I think we were saying to each other a, 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 after leaving the theater, sometimes getting into that kind of physical condition can have a bit of an after effect for the rest of your life and how you physically can do things. Uh, so hopefully the best for him uh, with all that. But um, still, like, did a great job. Um, and the fact that, like, they made a point to say that uh, Kevin, almost said Van Buren, Kevin Van Eric, <laughs> it, in real life is a six foot two person. Bemil Zach Efron's like five foot eight or something like that. So it, it was just kind of obvious that, like, okay, he's not quite the real life person. That was one element that actually did kind of take me out of the movie a little bit. But all that being said, everything was otherwise fairly seamless and well connected. And, uh, and, and in spite of all the tragedy, the moments of levity actually were, uh, were actually like very charming. Uh, and, and seeing the, these people interact with, without the dad being there and being actually nice to each other was like, yeah, remarkably charming. Uh, and, uh, yeah, for those that have either had a lot of, uh, exposure to, or not any exposure to the ideas of elements of toxic masculinity or, uh, generational trauma, uh, this is a, a good movie that highlights a lot of those things without being overbearing. And, uh, and I feel accomplished it very, very well and tastefully, um, so with all that serious stuff aside, I guess I give it a, a bruiser brody out of bruiser brody. But um, no, go see it. And and uh, wrestling fan or no, go see it. And, and I hope you enjoy it. Very good. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you're, t- you're all too kind. Please, please. <laughs> and a very appropriate Undertaker dong. Uh, <laughs> okay, the, uh, the 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 instrument, not not a dong. Okay, no, no. please show us the Undertaker's, <laughs> the Undertaker's dong. Everyone on screen now. Penis. The Undertaker's dong. Oh, gee. That's so what it looks like. Skin. Yep, that's a picture of the Undertaker's penis. Uh, Steve, what are your final thoughts for the film, The Iron Claw? I. <sighs> I must say that this is a well-constructed movie from beginning to end. Um, from the the opening that you know, like, brings you back to movies that are about pure athleticism, uh, Scorsese-esque notes from the start uh, to just the building blocks of like of sport movies and you know then you you go into the biopic stuff it's it's formulaic in a way that that works i i I don't know if you guys watch a lot of uh a lot of movies that like you know fully go into uh the characterization of athletes but like usually it's it's a little bit hollow and this it's it felt full to me um, it, it may have been because of the fact that it was so full of characters, you know, from both parents to all four of the brothers in this movie. Wait, was there five? I don't yeah, remember. Five, yeah. So many. Uh, and then there was a sixth that wasn't even in it. Holy shit. It's a lot of, it's a lot of brothers. Um, I think that this movie, uh, it, do, it does a lot in making you kind of like feel something for something that you, that otherwise you might not actually have any interest in whatsoever. Um, You know, like boxing movies and uh, basketball movies, baseball movies, all sporting movies, you know, they, they have that sort of hurdle that they have to have to make. And this did it without even really needing much other than, uh, pairing their uh, montages of fights with just montages of, of, of things happening. Uh, I, 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 I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm a little bit overwhelmed with it. Like, I, I don't know how to land on a, a, a solid rating that's like funny or entertaining. Like, I, I, I just think that this is a, a really good movie. And 
I recommend everybody go see it. And if you don't like it, that's fine. But if you don't like it and you're near me, I'm going to give you the fucking iron claw right on the top of your freaking eyeballs, right above your eyeballs. And I'm going to make it bleed. I'm going to make it painful and it's going to hurt. All right. All right. Consider All yourselves right. warned. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Undertaker Dong. Oh. <laughs> we had a system, it's cool. Um, so I guess with that, uh, I'm gonna do something a little different, and I'm gonna read my review from the night I watched the movie, and I'm going to preface this by saying my opinion has changed after I was able to think about it for a few months. And my rating has actually changed. My my number rating has actually changed yeah. by a full. Point. It's gonna start like it was a dark and stormy night. By a full point. And the iron claw was scraping at my door. Quote the Raven. <laughs> Nevermore. <laughs> it's a well-made A24 film. That much is true. To get the most of uh, to get the most of the impact, though, I suggest not looking up anything about the family uh, beforehand, and it helps to not be an expert about wrestling. The wrestling element swings wildly between spoon feeding terminology and putting in things for people in the know, but sways more towards a general audience. They messed up some pretty big elements like Carrie Von Eric's height and omitting a brother completely. I also think Zach Efron took the muscle gain way too far. I should feel lucky, I guess, that they uh, even took this level of care with a wrestling film, but I think The Wrestler is a better film is the better film, which we're going to find out this month if it is or it isn't. I don't think that it is. We, we talked passionately about this movie for now nah, three Are and they a half. In a competition? Is there a competition we didn't know? Is it scheduled for one fall? It's scheduled for one fall. Introducing first me telling you my rating of the film the day I watched it. 3.6 out of 5. No. Incorrect. It's a 4.5 easily. Easily. I didn't realize that I would be so affected by it watching it a second time when I was able to move all the bullshit out of my head and objectively watch it as the amazing masterpiece that it is. And I give this movie, Zach Efron looked like a pumpkin. No, rude. <laughs> um, he had and, an accident. He fell. It's true. <laughs> he fell down. It's true. They, they <laughs> really went more, bed. They really went more for uh, make him look like his own father in this uh, uh, versus make him look like head on top of a cube head or whatever. exactly. But yeah, that's my that's that's my rating. Just to add to that, I think that uh, cinematography wise, it's phenomenal. Uh, I watched it in ultra high definition on a good TV, so it was it might have even looked better than in theater because it wasn't projected. Um, it's a masterpiece. The acting is amazing. The score is amazing. The, the, the stuff you were connecting about paying homage to like Raging Bull and, and old sports flicks and old gladiator flicks. Amazing. I think that I want to, whatever this guy's Sean, Tom, Timothy, Sean Chalamet or whatever his name is. <laughs> I want to see on Durkin Durkin. I want to see whatever his next thing is. I will, I will see that. And, uh, that's my review. That's my final thought. <clears throat> Good, 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 good. It, we're all clapping. We're all wondering what's happening. And uh, yeah. uh, Tim, just before we get out of here and before I do my rigmarole at the end, do you have anything that you want to plug? <laughs> just, the just, the, just the Undertaker's dong, I guess. But. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, uh, at, at the moment, the only thing I have to plug is the dimple on uh, Ric Flair's chin, but that's about it at the with moment. With a cork. <laughs> with a cork and a hammer. Actually, not a dimple, it's an inverted nipple. <laughs> <laughs> and you can suck milk out of that. Oh my God. And he goes, oh! <laughs> canceled. You're all canceled. Um, <laughs> canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Chip uh, nipple. <clears throat> we, uh, we are, of course, I, I want to plug this show. You can find us on all social media. I said at the beginning, uh, we're very active on Facebook, Instagram, 
Twitter, and we are on Twitch and YouTube right now, live every week at 8 p.m. Uh, on Thursday. You can find us at uh, youtube.com slash hey, did you see this one? Pretty much there everywhere else. Please like and follow us. We had our highest uh, consistent viewership tonight, which I think is pretty exciting uh for over three hours which is amazing that's kind of what we do here we are the long form podcast of the united federation of podcasts um which is of course a uh podcast network that encompasses many podcasts that cover all sorts of different stuff there's the live long i'm gonna get the pictures for this for next week we'll figure it out uh there's the live long and uh podcast podcast about star trek trivial debates uh each month or bi-monthly they pick it th- they pick a topic i found what- it it's right here <laughs> three people <laughs> oh was it rick flair again <laughs> three people uh debate a subject and somebody another guest uh sort of uh judges it the x-rated and the x-men animated podcast x-men 97 is now airing they are live each and every week talking about that show there's hold up a movie podcast sort of our sister podcast where they cover three movies in two hours and we cover one movie in five hours (laughs) um six if i have my way this podcast is doing a 10-hour streamathon soon look check your local facebook uh iman on track which is a music podcast i haven't had the privy of listening to yet but it sounds interesting i'm going to try to get on that i'm going to talk about some uh, mars volta if i can uh the super mater brothers podcast which is the right now they're doing the survivor uh, coverage and the graphic histories podcast, which I, which is a comic book, uh, graphic novel podcast. Um, I think that's everything I have covered everything. So now do our outro song. Thanks for watching. And then the United Federation sting. And I will close this cocksucker down. Okay. It's me, Zach Efron's chin, and it's me, Ric Flair's chin. We're both chins, and we're putting each other in each other's chins. Oh, man. I never thought about the fact that both those chins could make one super chin. Like a suction cup sound as they break apart. (laughs) (laughs) They're fighting. They're fighting. They're fighting. Oh, God. Fucking? Are they fucking? <laughs> God damn. Holy hell. He just gave him a, a giant chin slam and...